Hi, good morning, everybody. Just checking that you can, people can see me. Hey, good morning, Dr. Driver. Are you hearing us? Yep. Okay, great. We just need you to switch out your um, virtual background. Oh, okay. Um, I'm a bit worried about that white virtual background because it's, um, I've got white hair. But anyway, okay, <laughs> let me try and see. You'll be fine. Well, I don't know. It always looks a bit weird with white. Okay, let me try it then. Okay, hi, I've got the virtual background up. Great, we are seeing you. Your hair looks fine. I don't know, white never doesn't quite, anyway, okay, we'll go. I hope the bandwidth stays okay to keep using okay. it. Great, so we'll right. introduce you when you're ready. Okay, so we're starting like, an, uh, I'll be on at about 9.30, is that right? Yes. Okay, I'll keep, I'll keep on, I'll keep the, I'll keep the link up, um, but I'll turn my camera off. Okay. Okay. All right, I'll see you guys in a while.
Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Eldorado Offshore in collaboration with the Society of Petroleum Engineers, UTT, SB Student Chapters Virtual Career Workshop. My name is Adrian Thomas, and I'm the Vice President of the UTT SB Student Chapter, and it's a pleasure to be your host this morning. We have some amazing speakers and workshops lined up for you all. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Ms. Serona Williams, the Vice President of Eldorado Offshore, to give us the welcome address. Serona has more than eight years of experience working in the oil and gas industry. She holds a BSc in Public Sector Management from the University of the West Indies and an MBA in Human Resources Management, specializing in competency-based recruitment from the Arthur Love Jack Graduate School of Business. Again, her academic, professional and, her academic and professional experience has developed her as a thought leader in business development, human capital development, personal logistics, finance operations, and general management, predominantly in the oil and gas industry regionally. As an offshore recruitment expert, Ms. Samaru has accumulated both regional and international experience. She was notably the only female on her team stationed to lead an offshore recruitment project in Malaysia in her early days in the energy sector. Serona currently manages and oversees all operations for Eldorado Offshore Regional. Eldorado Offshore has entities incorporated in Guyana, Trinidad, and Suriname due to the oil and gas exploration and discoveries there. Under her leadership, the EDO team in each country were able to rapidly scale up Eldorado Offshore's business with a headcount of 200 employees to now employing over 500 employees regionally within one year and during a pandemic. Her experiences within her academic, extracurricular, and professional roles from a young age have been the cornerstone of her success, allowing her to pivot and adapt as a young female leader and executive in a male-dominated industry. Serona is a strong advocate for youth development and a female empowerment in the workplace at all levels. She pushes boundaries and inspires those around her to do the same. Her innovation and creativity as an individual make her an asset to any role she serves. Serona, welcome. Good morning, Adrian, and thank you for the introduction. Dr. Dax Driver, Chief Executive Officer of the Energy Chamber of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Neil Allen, Senior Instructor of Energy Systems Engineering Unit at UTT. Mr. Xavier Munan, Exploration Manager, Touchstone Exploration Inc. Ms. Vanessa James from the National Energy Skills Center. Ms. Evangeline Paradisi, President of the Society for Petroleum Engineering Students at UTT. Members of the Eldorado Offshore team and our virtual audience tuned in today. Good morning and a warm welcome to our audience and to everyone tuned in internationally, locally, and regionally. To quickly update our virtual audience about our core services, EDO is the leading manpower supply, recruitment, and personal logistics company in the region. Currently, Eldorado Offshore employs over 500 professionals in the energy sector in our entities in Trinidad, Guyana, and Suriname. Our backdrop of our success story was our ability to rapidly scale up our business in a pandemic regionally by doubling our headcount in the energy sector in all entities we operate in. Our people, processes, and technology have been the main contributing factors in our game-changing success as the leading manpower supply company regionally. I believe that what we thought would happen 10 years into the future was brought forward by the pandemic and is now right in front of us. The future is here and it is now. And the best way to be successful with these rapid changes is to innovate, continually improve our processes and consistently build our capabilities and capacity within our human resources. At EDU, our focus is not just on the effort it takes to execute an event like this, but more so on the impact we want to create and the value we want to add to the lives of everyone attending today. The impact we want to create by having all of you here today is to continue to ignite the hope and fire in young graduates who have dreamt all their life of finding their dream job in the energy sector to be able to get the exposure and information from this workshop 
to propel them from being the best and brightest graduates at university to becoming the disruptors of change, the innovators, and the biggest game changers in the energy sector in Trinidad and Tobago, regionally and internationally. This is the impact we hope to trigger here today. As part of EDO's corporate social responsibility and in alignment with our theme for this year, which is focused on capacity and capability building, we agreed to partner with the Society of Petroleum Engineering Students at UTT to execute this first ever virtual career workshop in Trinidad to provide prospective candidates, graduate and undergraduate students with the opportunity to hear from subject matter experts in the energy sector in Trinidad and Tobago about the immediate, medium term and long term opportunities available to them in the sector. EDO's HR and HSSEQ team will also be presenting on the current vacancies in Trinidad and regionally. What are the requirements to get those jobs? What are some of the tips you can utilize to prepare yourself for interviews for the jobs of your calling? And the importance of maintaining a strong safety culture in the energy sector and how EDO is committed to practice top-notch health and safety practices to protect our employees offshore and onshore. I would like to thank everyone who came together from our internal team to plan this event, the UTT team and our feature and guest speakers for the time taken to impart their knowledge and expertise to all our attendees today. Trinidad and Tobago is ripe with opportunities in the energy and non-energy sector. It is our national duty as leaders in the, energy, in the industry to ensure that we ignite the hope in the generations coming after us and share our expertise to build capacity and capability in them so that they can stand on our shoulders and reap even greater success for the energy sector in Trinidad and Tobago. I always like to look at the energy sector as a weave. Sometimes the tide is high, sometimes it, is, it may be low, but the key to remaining relevant and successful is to ensure that you ride that weave no matter what the tide may be, and you build yourselves with the soft skills and technical training to pivot and adapt in any situation and not allow yourselves to be toppled over by that weave. I am happy to be part of this event today, and I am even more excited to see how many of our attendees from UTT and other universities will take what they have learned here today and use it as building blocks to create their success stories professionally in the energy sector or any sector of their calling. The next three hours are going to be packed with exciting presentations, and I hope that all of you who are here today will leave with more than you came with. To all graduate students here, Continue to step out of your comfort zone and challenge yourself to learn something new every day about all aspects of your field of study. Despite how highly stacked the odds may be, sometimes I always believe that there's opportunity in everything. And the best way for us to be successful is to continuously learn, create opportunities through creativity and innovation, and always help as many people you can and in any way you can. To every undergraduate or graduate student here today, Never ever doubt that you are valuable, powerful, and deserving of every chance in the world to achieve your greatest potential. What I have learned in this industry is that it is not so much the destination as it is the journey. Grit and fire in your belly to get things done is a main component for success at work. And the pie in the sky ideas often turn out to be the greatest game-changing ideas. Good luck to each of you in your journeys. And I hope someday in years to come, I will be the one tuning in to listen to some of or all of you when you use the inspiration from our feature and guest speakers here today and your knowledge and experience to become subject matter experts and success stories in your professional lives. I hope this workshop helps all of you attending to maximize your greatest potential. Thank you very much. Enjoy the workshop. Be safe. And over to you, Adrian. Uh, thank you, Serena, for that welcome address. What a great way to kick things off. Uh, in everything we do, safety first and safety always. So let's jump right into our safety moment with Shane Magru, HSSE officer at Eldorado Offshore. Morning, guys. It's a today's safety moment is life saving rules, guys. So can't. Right. Just excuse me one second, guys. Let's get a little problem here. All right. 
So introduction for the upstream oil and gas industry, life-saving rules are among the most effective. Each of the nine rules highlights a key action to prevent fatal injuries during activities that research has shown to be high risk. Aimed at individual workers, every rule is geared to a specific task. So this is rule number one, bypassing safety rules. Obtain authorization before overriding or disabling safety controls. I understand and use safety critical equipment and procedures which apply to my task. I obtain authorization before I obtain authorization before disabling or overriding safety equipment, deviating from procedures, crossing barriers. Rule number two, confined space. Obtain authorization before entering a confined space. I confirm energy sources are isolated. I confirm the atmosphere has been tested and is monitored. I check and use my breathing apparatus when required. I confirm there's an attendant standing by. I confirm a rescue plan is in place. I obtain authorization to enter. Rule number three, driving. Follow safe driving rules. I always wear a safety belt. I do not exceed the speed limit and reduce my speed for road conditions. I do not use phones or operate devices while driving. I am fit, rested, and fully alert while driving. I follow journey management requirements. Rule number four, energy isolation. Verify isolation and zero energy before work begins. I have identified all energy sources. I confirm that energy, hazardous energy sources have been isolated, locked, and tabbed. I have, zero, I have checked there is zero energy and tested for residual or stored energy. Rule number four, hot work. Control flammables and ignition sources. I identify and con con control ignition sources. Before starting any hot work, I confirm flammable material has been removed or isolated. I obtain authorization. Before starting hot work in a hazardous area, I confirm a gas test has been completed. Gas test, gas will be monitored continually. Rule number six, line of fire. Keep yourself and others out of the line of fire. I position myself to avoid moving objects, vehicles, pressure releases, drop objects. I establish and obey barriers and exclusion zones. Safe mechanical lifting, rule number seven. Plan lifting operations and control the area. I confirm that the equipment and load has been inspected and are fit for purpose. I only operate equipment that I am qualified to use. I establish and obey barriers and exclusion zone. I never walk under a suspended load. Rule number eight, work authorization. Work with a valid permit when required. I have confirmed if the permit is required. I am authorized to perform the work. I understand the permit. I have confirmed that hazards are controlled and it is safe to start. I stop and reassess if conditions change. And rule number nine, number nine working at height. Protect yourself against a fall when working at height. I inspect my fall protection equipment before use. I secure tools and work materials to prevent drop objects and I tie off 100% to approve anchor points while outside a protected area. In conclusion, there's a, lot, there's a lot of value in having everybody with the same understanding. Whether you go to an installation or facility operated by Slumberger, BP or Shell, or any number of companies, everybody is talking the same life-saving rules language. The rules do save lives. So these rules, um, ladies and gentlemen, to any company that you go out there, you would see these life-saving rules. Some may have nine, some may have 10, some may have eight, but a lot of companies outside there in the oil and gas use these life-saving rules. So that is my um, presentation today. If you all have any questions, feel free to ask me here on the presentation. No questions, guys? Okay, well, if no questions, um, hope you all enjoy the rest of the um, program here today. And thanks again, guys. Okay, thank you, Shane, for that safety moment. We know that safety should be at the forefront of, of all of our minds when doing anything in this industry.
I'd now like to invite Dr. Neil Allen, Assistant Professor of the Energy Systems Engineering Unit at the University of Tehran, Tobago, to give us the UTT address. Neil Allen graduated with a BSc in Petroleum Engineering from Imperial College in 1974 and joined a Moko Trinidad Oil Company, a predecessor company of BPTT. Over a career that spanned 30 years, he worked for Amoco and BP locations in Trinidad and in the USA and was involved in operations in Trinidad, USA, Japan, Indonesia, and Australia, and found the time to complete a diploma in management studies at the University of the West Indies in 1980 and an MBA at the University of Houston in 1999. While the majority of his time at Amoco and BP was spent in petroleum engineering roles, Neil also worked in the production department, the commercial unit, and the change management unit. His last role at BPTT was VP Organizational Transformation. Neil joined UTT in 2004 and was instrumental in the establishment of the petroleum engineering program. Since completing his MSc in Petroleum Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin in 2008, Neil has been involved in teaching and research. His interest in natural gas stretches back to his time at Amoco, when as a young engineer in the late 1970s, he was part of a study on the long-term utilization of natural gas at Amoco. This interest continued in his MSc thesis on the monetization of natural gas through liquefied natural gas, LNG, and culminated in his doctoral research on deep water gas field developments. He is a charter petroleum engineer, a member of the Energy Institute, and has been a member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers for 49 years. He has served the Trinidad and Tobago chapter of the SP in a number of important roles including being the chairman of the chapter. He is passionate about the development of tomorrow's leaders, the young people. Dr. Allen, the floor is yours. Thank you for your introduction, um, Master Ceremonies. To the pro professionals and the leaders from El Dorado Offshore. Good morning to my fellow panelists, to members of the SPE uh, student chapter, and to you, listen audience. Today, I want to talk about packing for a journey, or packing for a destination. To assist me in doing that, I want you to think of our destination, which we're going to go and spend a week in this destination. So you go in there for a one week. It's going to be a place that you know very well, a place that you like, and a place where you know the type of things you like to do there. So that's the place we go into. That's the destination. So pick a destination, and it must be far enough away from your home so that you can't go back home for anything which you have forgotten. In other words, you must pack for the journey. So we are packing for a journey. My destination is Mayaro. I picked that because I know Mayaro very well. It's a, a coastal town in Trinidad. In Trinidad. It's, it's very famous for its beaches. Mayaro has lovely beaches. In fact, you can get in Mayaro stretches of beach of four miles. And because in Mayaro, the beach is very gently sloping, between the tides, you can get very large stances of beach exposed. You can get about a 100 yard beach width beach for four miles. So it's a lovely place for walking and for other beach time activities. I love that. That's my destination. It doesn't have to be yours, but pick one that you understand, but you like, and you like to go to. In my case, I like walking and running on the beach. So in my bag, I have packed a couple of pairs of sneakers. I packed three pairs. Three pairs because I want to do a lot of walking and running in my arrow. And if one pair were to get wet in one day, next day I want to be able to continue doing that same activity uninterrupted. I packed some pairs of running socks some running shorts, some track pants, but I want to pack some, uh, some t-shirts, some running t-shirts. I'm also packing some swim trunks because even though I don't like going into the water, I'm going to Mayaro, so 
I mean, the environment, so I must be prepared for my environment in which I'm operating, where, where I'll be um, spending my time. Pack some shoes and slippers because I'll be at home, it's close for the house. Some clothes to go out in the evening as well. I may have to go off to a restaurant and surely I can't go to a restaurant in swim trunks. So I need to pack, prepare for that as well. At the same time, even though I'm going to Miaro for walking and, and running in Miaro, I'm going to put into my bag some information on running and walking opportunities in other places close to Miaro, for example, Rio Claro. So just in case something were to happen in Miaro and I couldn't walk and run in Miaro, I can do it somewhere else, namely Rio Claro. I put into my bag some playing cards because I want to play cards, some dominoes, give a scrabbler, a couple of books. Because even though I'm planning to walk and run in Miharo for most of the time, should it rain, I need to be able to find some other things which I can do to people I meet there. So I'm packing those other things just in case things don't turn out as I initially planned, I can fall back and do something else with those other items which I carry into my, in my bag. So, so much for what is going into my bag. I also have to have some mental preparation for my trip to me in Mayaro, my destination. And one of the first things is my willingness and interest in communicating with people. I've always found that when you're out walking or jogging, you meet someone on the trail, being able to share interests with them is so interesting. And sometimes you can share them which they like, and they may share tips with you which can improve your running or your exercise or whatever your activity you're involved in. So I have to go out there willing and ready to communicate with people. Also, in my mind, I want to go out there and learn things. I've always been fascinated when I go to Miaro at people who do parasailing. And I can't parasail myself, but I'm hoping this time when I go, I'll go prepared to learn to parasail. Of course, to learn, one has to humble one, be humble and be willing to go out there and experiment and learn new things. So I'll be doing that as well. So mentally prepared to learn things. Also, I have to be adaptable because even though I'm planning to walk and I'm planning to use the beach, I may go to Miaro and there may be a large buildup of seaweed on the beach as happens sometimes. So I can't use the beach. So then or it may rain and I can't, we can't walk and can't run. So therefore I have to be adaptable. So when I go there, I can fall back on those other things and meet, the pe meet the pe people who I, who I go there, meet them, and use them to engage in other activities, very enjoyable, even though not what I plan to do in the first case. So, so that's all I do. And also when I go there, I really need to see possibilities, look in situations and see what is possible. All right, don't be, I won't be fixated on what should be, I'll be fixated on what is, and what's possible from what I have in front of me. So that is where I'll, I'll be preparing for my trip to, to Miaro. So let's kind of step back a little bit. We have done that. And let's now transition now to what you are doing here today, your career fair. Actually, that destination which you have chosen or that journey is really your career which you have planned for, the career which you have been preparing for all your life. So let's look at what you put into our bag. When I put those sneakers and those running shoes into my bag, what I was putting in there, in your case, would be all the things you have studied for all these years, be it chemistry, history, physics, petroleum engineering, whatever you have studied. Those skills that you have built very carefully and very well. Those are the things you put into your bag first. So they are in your bag right now. Also, those cards and those are other things, well, those are the meta skills. Because while you are learning chemistry or history or petroleum engineering or science, or in art, or whatever you were learning, at the same time, you're gaining some meta skills. These are transferable skills. You're learning, for example, how to, um, to research topics, how to research things which, which you have no little, little about, use people's experiences, and create a project. You learn to do that. You learn how to set goals and how to achieve targets. You learn how to, to meet deadlines. You learn how to do critical thinking about topics. You also learn how to make presentations and to write technical reports and time management. You also worked in teams and learned how to work effectively with teams. And those are extremely important skills. So you were building some meta skills which are transferable throughout to other activities, even other than those which you have first def um, designed them um, around. So you have done that. And then in our bag, we, I, we place that information on other running in the, in the area. 
For example, if you're involved in the energy industry, you may want to be active in Trinidad and Tobago, but it really makes important that we learn what's happening in other places. For example, Guyana has a, a expanding petroleum industry, a large industry. They, they will be very big in years to come. Next to them is Suriname. So in other words, cast the visitors beyond just one place. Be open to going out to, to Guyana or go to Suriname to, for if you're interested in energy. So there's that piece. And, and then we spoke about the, so those, those were the things you put in your bag, the sort of physical things. But then we spoke also about the, the, soft, the soft skills that was said earlier this morning, how to get along with people. And getting along with people is very important. That, that actually is a very interpersonal, interpersonal skills are very important because they actually, uh, how you communicate to people who you're working with in, in the world of work. All right, very important that we have to do that very well. Also, we spoke about willing to being willing to learn. Learning is one of those very, very fascinating experiences of human beings. Learning new things is extremely, ex extremely exciting. So as we go out there, we need to be prepared to learn. Now learning often means listening intently. So when we communicate and you communicate with people, it's said to be very effective in communicating you should listen 70% and speak about 30%. So in other words, we should really do a lot more listening than we do speaking. Now, I'm not telling you not to be confident, not, not to speak out there, but if you find yourself speaking all the time, chances are you may be losing opportunity to, to, to learn. All right, so remember that. Also, we said, let's be adaptable. Let's be willing to, to change. We said, for example, we plan to go walking in, or running in Mayaro, but if it was raining, we do something else. So if, so therefore we were ready to use those meta skills to pivot to something different if what we, if what we plan isn't there. You know, one thing which we have heard for people who sail boats, they will tell you that you can't change the wind, but you can always adjust the sail on your boat to make progress regardless of the wind being, in, being against you. So in other words, we can use those meta skills and use all our talents to steer things, even though the environment may seem not to be very conducive to, to making progress. And before I close, I want to say something else about, about, about life. Most of us have been in cars. And in a car, you see a large windscreen and a small rear view mirror. And there's a reason for that. I think the relative sizes, that's important. And that is because you want you to live your life through the windscreen. Don't be preoccupied with the, with the rearview mirror, with things which you may have missed or you thought you may have missed. Live life through the, the, rear, the windscreen. And also look out there at the possibilities. Don't think of what, how things are supposed to be. Think of how they are and given how they are, what is possible. It's very important that we do that see life as possibilities. What is possible in whatever environment you are, you may find yourself. So what is possible? So now we have packed our bags. We've packed our bags, our minds are made up, we're excited. Um, I am looking forward to a very enjoyable stay in Mayaro and I plan for it. And I'm sure you have planned and prepared very well. You have packed your bags very well. You are well packed for the journey. So I know you'll enjoy the destination. Have a good time in the career, enjoy your career. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alan. It's always a pleasure again you speak, especially when you give analogies like you did there with the car and the windshield. Moving on, we have none other than Dr. Dakre Dax Driver, President and CEO of the Energy Chamber of Trinidad and Tobago, to give us the featured address. Dr. Driver has been the Chief Executive Officer of the Energy Chamber of Trinidad and Tobago since 2003. He has pioneered numerous new initiatives and activities for the Energy Chamber, including the Safe to Work Program and the Learning Center. He is the immediate past chair of the Caribbean Chamber's network. He was previously the chairman of the Trinidad and Tobago Economic Development Board and has been a board member of the Trinidad and Tobago Coalition of Services Industries the University of Trinidad and Tobago, and 
Trinidad and Tobago Natural Gas Liquids Limited. Prior to joining the Energy Chamber, he was the coordinator of the Trinidad and Tobago Agricultural Sector Reform Program. He has a PhD in history from the University of London. Dr. Driver, over to you. Thank you very much and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, congratulations to uh, uh, university students getting up on a Saturday morning to, to log in uh, at uh, 9.30 here in, in the um, Southern Caribbean. I'm very impressed that so many of you managed to, to get up uh, and, and log in. I'm not sure if I would have managed that when I was a student. Um, so uh, good morning. I, uh, I'm the CEO of the Energy Chamber. Um, so we are the trade association representing the, the oil and gas, petrochemical, and increasingly the renewables industry. Um, in Trinidad and Tobago, with also membership in, in the wider region as well. About 400 member companies, and our, our role is to represent those companies and to, to, to make sure that we create the environment in which they can flourish and, uh, and uh, create uh, jobs and opportunities, um, uh, hopefully for, for all of you. So this morning, I was going to talk on, on three ma main topics uh, I've been asked to talk about. First of all, just a few reflections on the future of the, of the energy industry. Um, then what, that, what does that mean for jobs and, and for young people like yourselves who are looking to, to, to enter this industry? And then just some sort of some tips and ideas sort of based on, on, on my experiences, I guess. So, so if we start the first about the future of the energy industry, well, I think that, you know, it's fair to say there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, it is, uh, it's difficult to, 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 to predict what's, what is happening uh, at, a, at a micro level, but then there's things that we do know about. So I think that if you think about that, that analogy of the waves rolling in, you know, we know that the waves are rolling in and, and, and things are changing. Uh, it's difficult to predict exactly how each wave will arrive and the, and the little currents around that. Um, and, uh, you know, there's things which come which are very unexpected. I was convinced that there was no way that Russia was going to invade Ukraine. Um, and I had a, you know, a, a, an argument with my wife about it, saying she was being silly when she thought this was going to happen. I was clearly, I was totally wrong and she was <laughs> totally right. Um, but uh, it's very difficult to predict those sort of things. But then there are things you sort of do know about, um, uh, which you know are happening. So I think if we predict the sort of the mega trends, you, you, you know that the, those are going to be uh, taking place. People are going to need energy and they're going to need more energy in the future as the world population um, uh, grows. Um, and uh, as uh, hopefully the, you know, the, of the pattern of the last three decades of, of uh, um, wealth continues to expand around the world, people will need more energy. Um, so that is, I think, something which you're pretty certain about, that people are going to need more energy. But we also know that that energy is going to come from lower carbon sources. Um, how, exactly how that's going to roll out is very uncertain, but we know that that's the direction of travel, that, um, that there will be a demand for lower carbon energy. Uh, that has been driven by government regulations all around the world and government policy, but also crucially by the capital markets, where people who are making investment decisions and want, want to put their investment dollars. So that is, that is happening. That does not mean there is no future for, for oil and gas and hydrocarbons. It's just that the way in which they will be used will be changing. Um, and uh, that there, there will be a need to decarbonize those resources as they're being, as they're being produced. And that is gonna continue. It doesn't mean, net zero doesn't mean the end of, of hydrocarbons, but it means that there'll be different ways in which they're, they're produced and this energy systems will, will be different. We know that's gonna happen. Um, and we should, we, we should all be committed to that process uh, of, of, of that because the, the world's future relies upon it, particularly here in the Caribbean, uh, with small islands, very vulnerable to, to, to hurricanes, uh, low-lying coastal states like Guyana and Suriname, very vulnerable to sea level rise. So you know, we need to be part of that process. Uh, and that is the way the world is going. And that's where, where investment decisions are being made. That means also that electrification is going to be a big part of that decarbonization. We are going to see increasingly the use of, of electric mo motors rather than internal combustion engines. That is, that is happening. And it's going to continue to happen and we should just you know i think everyone should just know that there may be some ups and downs and how that happens how it rolls out it's going to, there are going to be some hiccups along the way uh, supply chains for batteries and solar panels are going to create you know, hiccups in the in, in, in the market and the, so the ripples are, uh, of that are, are going to, to to change but but the wave is coming and that is a wave which we have to to, to, to surf we also know that uh, you know, increasingly um, uh, automation uh, you know, is going to be happening in every sector uh, uh, around 
the way in which data is managed and, uh, and incorporated. And the pandemic brought forward a lot of that and, and the way in which we do things changed because of the pandemic. And here we are with a, with, with a virtual session, which may have been uh, just over two years ago. This may well have been done as a physical uh, event, but now everyone has moved virtual uh, because of the pandemic that brought forward a lot of things, but also then the whole way in which people work within the industry has changed. Um, so that uh, use of automation, the use of, uh, rem of, of remote um, sources of, of, of information is going to continue and, and going to um, just going to continue to accelerate. Um, and that's something which everyone needs to, to, to take into account as they're planning how they're moving forward into their careers. So to move from, so that's a, those are my broad thoughts on the future of the energy industry. You know, th th there will be a continued need for more and more energy, but it's going to have to be greener energy. Uh, there's going to be uh, then the automation. Um, uh, it's going to go on and the, and innovation around that will, will will continue and that is going to have a major impact on how the sector operates T determining the micro parts of how that's going to change is very difficult but then this now comes to my next point about what well, are the key attributes that that you will need um when, as you're looking for jobs and to and to build a career um because that first thing that comes there is that is that ability to be able to go on learning and to uh, and to adapt as things change when I first started working at the Energy Chamber almost 20 years ago, um, Trinidad was you know, developing our LNG, or our LNG industry had been developed and it was being sort of rolled out and was growing. And that was anchored on the United States um, going to be the biggest importer of, of, of LNG. That all completely changed when they found a new technology of, of, of how to uh, fracture um, first of all, gas wells and then later oil as well uh, to produce shale. Um, so that was a new technology event which we didn't see coming, but we had to then learn to adapt to that and, and, and the world changed with, with the technology changing, but it created great new opportunities and you, and you have to learn to adapt and to, and to change as things happen. So as you're going into your careers, that ability to go on learning, to continuously um, you know, change uh, and, and, and continuously get more information and to adapt what you do is, is, is absolutely crucial. So that also means you need to be flexible. Um, you, you have to, to, to not set out just with one, we're going in one direction. This is Dr. Lame so talking about this, about sailing. You can't predict, you know, that the wind will change, but you can adapt your sails to, to, to be able to always sail. Um, so that flexibility is really important. Curiosity is, is absolutely uh, you know, vital. Be interested in, in, in the industry that, you, that you're working in uh, and all aspects of it. Don't just get bogged down in your little area, the, your technical area that you're working in. Um, you know, look at what's happening across the whole industry uh, and, and, and broadly across the, the, the energy industry. Don't restrict yourself to oil or to gas or to renewables or, or, or to electrification or to hydropower or whatever it is. Look broadly at, at everything and, and, and educate yourself constantly. So that curiosity is really important. Creativity is really crucial. That is going to be that's going to be a thing which sets people apart. Uh, you know, can they creatively find new ways to, 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 to solve problems? So that creative thinking, I think, is absolutely crucial um, you know, to, for, for anybody to build a successful career. Um, that has to be done. Creativity, sometimes people think about you know, the, the single genius sort of working alone, but that's not how people really actually are creative. They, people are creative in teams. So be able to work in teams, be able to listen to your, to, to your, uh, your, your, your teammates, um, and to be able to also work in diverse teams as well um, you know, across different cultures. The energy industry is a global industry. You'll be always working with people from different parts of the world, different backgrounds. Um, you know, and, and being able to adapt to that. And uh, I think actually that is a huge advantage which people from the, the, the Caribbean have because they are so used to dealing with different cultures. I mean, particularly Trinidad, um, Guyana and Suriname, where we have this fantastic mix of different, uh, different cultures. And we're just so used to that. That is actually quite unusual around the world. People don't uh, have that same way of working uh, and knowing, you know, celebrating each other's cultures, which we've done, we do really well here in the, in the, in the Southern Caribbean. Um, so that is also an important part of it for individuals. But saying that around curiosity, creativity, team, uh, you know, and, and flexibility, that doesn't mean that compliance isn't also really important. So high compliance with what the rules are is absolutely crucial within this industry as well particularly on on you know safety we know that and, and we started this 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 session with a with, with a safety you know, moment but being knowing that you have to comply with what the rules say that you have to do 
is absolutely crucial. So not, not cutting corners, um, yeah, because that will get you in, in, into trouble. So that compliance with what the rules are. Now you can discuss what the rules are and what they should be and if they should change, but when the rules are set, you have to comply with what, with what the rules are. That is just the reality of this industry. And it's not just safety, it's also an ethics. So behaving ethically is absolutely, you know, I think absolutely crucial and constantly think about is what I'm doing uh, the, the right ethical thing to, to be doing. If you don't constantly check yourself, you can find yourself um, unwittingly um, doing things which you later later regret. I, I think that the the uh, the red face test, which I don't know if people have heard about this when you're talking about ethics and compliance, is all, as a fantastic test. How would you feel if this was on the front of the newspaper tomorrow? What you would what you were doing? So that that sense of compliance was also very important. So just you know, please. Uh, when we're talking about flexibility, creativity, that doesn't mean you don't have to comply. You have to also comply with what the rules are when they're set. Um, the last thing I would just say is that uh, mentioned earlier, but that grit, sticking with things, the ability to stick with it, even when, when, when things are tough, that I think is a really key attribute, which I think a lot of people hiring really look for on people, particularly in this day and age where things are, you know, are uncertain. Are uncertain. You, know, you want to make sure you've got people who are, who, who, who are going to be gritty and going to stick with things and persevere through through, um, you know, th through difficult situations. So you'll hear a lot of people who who, who hire people who talk about hiring for attitude first, um, and that is I think that is absolutely crucial. So what does that mean for what sort of jobs to look for? Well, I think it's really just you've got to have to just think about you know what are the things that, that you're that, that you're good at um, and uh, and think with those attitudes in, in, in mind. Um, and one thing I would say is that any job which can be easily automated is probably not something to, 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 to pin yourself to. So any job which you, you think is going to be easily automated uh, in, in the future, it's probably not the best job to build, to, to, to think right now to build a career, uh, career around. But anything which involves manual work, that you know, creative manual work, that's something which hands, uh, very difficult to automate a lot of those jobs. And then things which in great, that, 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 that involve creative thinking, uh, those are obviously also very difficult to automate. So those are sort of two things, almost like two, uh, two opposites. Yeah, the, the, the man you're working with your hands, because difficult to, to, to automate, particularly anything which involves any, in, any sort of uh, you know, motor skills which are, are unique and it's not, not going to be the same motion again and again. And then anything which involves creativity and, and, and thinking. So those are the sort of things I think where the jobs will be uh, in the future. Um, so just the, the last thing I was going to talk about is just some, some of my experiences and some tips. So when, um, when you know, my background was read out, I am not an engineer. Uh, I don't have a, a, an MBA. Um, I uh, don't have a degree in economics. I don't have a degree in geology. I have, a, I have a PhD in history and not just history. I have a PhD in the history of, of the environmental history of Lesotho in, in, in Southern Africa. So, I mean, what does that have to do with the oil and gas industry um, in Trinidad, Tobago, Guyana, Suriname? I mean, really very little. I mean, in terms of the, in terms of the knowledge acquisition, but I did learn skills doing that, which have been use, useful for me. Uh, I, I came to Trinidad for personal reasons. You know, my, my wife's Trinidadian and she wanted to come home. And so I moved in in, in my 20s um, and I ended up in the energy sector almost by just by chance, because that was there was a job which was available, which I'd applied to and I got and I had to, to learn about it. But what I had learned through my academic training was some of the skills that, 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 that I needed. Uh, and I'm just going to mention just before as I wind up a secret skill, the ability to read quickly and to digest a lot of information. It's been one of the key skills that I've managed to bring to, to my job. It's not something people talk about very often. People often talk about listening carefully, uh, being able to present and talk. But actually that ability to read uh, lots of information, technical information, rapidly, quickly and digest it is actually really a really useful skill to develop. So how do you develop that skill? Uh, this is my top tip, and it's going to sound very, uh, very um, a bit left field to a lot of you, but read fiction. Read, when you read fiction, you train your brain to read quickly and to digest a lot of information. It teaches you about people as well. Uh, we have fantastic literature in the, in, in the Caribbean. It's really strong literature now. There's a, there's a great literary movement going on at the moment in, in Trinidad and Tobago and in Guyana as well. Um, so that is something, just a, just a tip. Train your brain to absorb large amounts of written information by reading fiction. It's fun. 
um, and uh, it'll give you a whole perspective on a different perspective on life, but it actually also trains your brain to be able to, to, to absorb written information very fast. Um, so the, that is a sort of a tip I would give everybody. Um, and it, I always think about it's almost like exercising as you exercise your body. And Dr. Lane was talking about, you know, enjoying running as I do as well. Exercising is your body is very important, but exercising your mind is also important. So being healthy is, 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 is really important. So continuing to exercise, uh, eat healthily. And so my tip on eating healthily as well, to, if you want to keep uh, healthy, particularly for them, for, for them, uh, this is a tip, particularly a lot of men don't do this very well. Cook. If you cook your own food and eat your own food, you will inevitably eat much more healthy, more, more healthily than if you buy food um, out from, you know, from KFC or wherever. So learn how to cook as well. That's the other tip I'd give. So read, read fiction and learn, and learn to cook and continue to exercise. Those are my sort of three personal tips that I would give. So uh, I will stop there. Um, and uh, I, I think there was time for, I don't know if there was time for questions we want to do that, but I, I will remain online if there's any questions. Thank you, Dr. Driver, for giving us the feature address and really setting the tool for this workshop. I know many can agree that it was inspiring and impactful. Up next, we have Vanessa James, Student Affairs Officer at NESC Drilling Academy. Since 2015, Vanessa James has been a Student Affairs Officer at the NESC Drilling Academy in St. Martin. She provides students with academic support career guidance, and life mentoring at all stages of their skill training journey. Vanessa possesses a postgraduate degree in med mediation studies and a bachelor's degree in psychology with a minor in criminology from the University of the West Indies. Vanessa is passionate about employability within the energy and industrial sectors. She has supported numerous students in getting started in the career of their dreams. Over to you, Vanessa. Thank you so much. I'm extremely excited to be here today and share some very useful information to show you guys how you can enter the energy system, the energy sector in as little as two years. So just confirm for me that you can see my screen. Is this slide coming up? I'm not able to hear. Okay, excellent. All right, so NESE, I'm honored to represent this company. We have been in existence since 1997, so that's 25 years. And we were really born out of the demand for skilled tradesmen and tradesmen. Our primary purpose is building the human capital in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, and we continue to do so. We have a number of affiliates. Uh, some of these logos you all may recognize. And it's through these affiliations that our stakeholders, uh, they are short of quality, internationally recognized training and certification that we offer our students. There are a number of programs that we offer the NESC, three levels, including the diploma programs, the craftsman level programs, and the professional programs. These diploma programs are two years and they would allow you to get a technician diploma at the end of the course. You can also access three certificates by just completing one course. All right, so that's pretty awesome. The Craftsman level course, those are level two technician programs and those are just one year programs. And they include courses like air condition and refrigeration, automotive services, autotronics, domestic electrician, drilling rig mechanic, heavy equipment operations, machine shop, plumbing, welding. We have professional certificates. So maybe you're already a professional, you just wanna top up your skills. We have courses like business computing, short courses, 
uh, ICT online training courses and even corporate training and services. And let me just add the diploma programs are all yet approved. So you can access automotive services, drill and rig operations, electrician, electrician and instrumentation, fabricator boiler maker, heavy equipment, information technology, network specialists, mill rights, refrigeration and air conditioning, and welding. So this is one of my favorite areas, job placement. I really, really enjoy seeing students transition from that student to employer, employee, right? And NESC also allows you to become an entrepreneur. So once you've established your work experience, what's to stop you from going and opening and providing that service directly to the public? So some of the companies that hire mill rights include Angostura Limited, Anson McCall, Chemicals Limited, Carb Brewery Limited, Anthony Marine Services, Atlantic LNG, Bermuda's Company, Blue Waters, Massey Energy, The Welders. The Welders are taken up by companies like 3D Mental Design, Car Welding Supplies, Limited Crew, Archer Welding and Fabrication Services, Answer Enterprises, Central Concrete Pulse, Demos, ASCII Engineering and Contracting. The auto students are taken by companies like Alsa McCall Auto, Allied Security Services, Hydraulics Components, Southern Sales, CarMax, FC Farfan, Lachlan and the Gans, Hot Wheels, Fire Boats. Electrican, electrician students, they go to companies like Massey Distributors, Southern Sales Limited, TN Tech Services, Trans Peruvian Electrical, Modern Electrical Suppliers, Nutrimix Feeds, Power Light Products, and Aronco Services. And these listings are not exclusive. All right. The fabricators are taken up by companies like Demas, Castelloid, WP Sheet Metal Works, Welding, Cutting, and Industrial Supplies, to name a few. The drill and rig operations. Those graduates are get taken up by companies like Baker Hughes, Halliburton, National Gas Company, Caribbean Analytical Services, Slumberger, uh, BG Tubular Services, Petroleum Marketing, to name a few, have equipment, companies like Nitrogen, Paramount, Transport and Trading, TNT Tower, Cranes, Lake Asphalt, Cats Global, Junior Sami, Pool Sales Contracting, to name a few. And lastly, the AC and refrigeration companies like AC Specialist, CC Air Condition, Peaks Air Condition, Coleman and Associates, Pool Connection in Limited, Intense Merchandising, Qualitech Air Condition and Refrigeration Company. So you can see there are a number of companies that partner with NESC to really supply their workforce. All right. The demand for skilled tradespersons are extremely high, all right? And we have seen through the pandemic that skilled persons have been able to withstand the test of time. They were able to continuously get work even in a pandemic, all right? And their skills are technology proof, recession proof, and transferable, of course, industries, very important. Now, I just want to highlight our drilling academy. So I would let you see this short video to get an idea of the drilling, drilling rig operations program at the NESC. Drilling, upstream, exploration and production, they all basically involve the extraction of oil and gas from below the Earth's surface. The, the skills and the equipment and the, the technology required for drilling is a highly specialized area and involves a lot of specialized equipment and skills. The NESC Drilling Academy is one of the very few schools in the world that actually offer this training. At the NESC Drilling Academy, we offer drilling rig operations diploma and a certificate level in the drilling rig maintenance. The drilling rig operations basically covers the, the theory and the practical required to understand the the intricacies of the actual operations on the drilling. The, it gives you a little bit of breakdown from the planning to the well, the well completions 
aspects of the drilling operations. Trinidad and Tobago are in the business of exporting not only products but labor as well. The, there's a scene in the industry that the two things they sort of find on a drilling rig is a five French and a Trini. And a Trini where we, ex we export a lot of the personnel to work in drilling rigs across the world and to increase their, their, their qualifications and competencies is one of the goals of the, the National Energy Skills Centre Drilling Academy. The reason for choosing the NESC Drilling Academy is basically is one of a kind and first in the region where we actually learn real practical skills on a rig from making and breaking drill connections. We learn pipe tallies, trip sheets, mud pumps, and the circulation system. Even work on the direct, on the, as a direct man on the monkey board and a few driller controls on the, on the consoles that we drill up. In the previous cycle, there was a colleague of mine who was actually working in Azerbaijan and, and next one working in Guyana. So there is opportunities abroad for work. I myself would like to work in Guyana basically because it's closer to home or Canada because it's a Canadian program as well. The oil and gas industry is a very unforgiving one, um, meaning that you can't afford to make mistakes. Our students, they are trained not just to understand theory or to sit in a classroom, but they are trained to go out there in the workplace and not make mistakes, to put their best foot forward. How do they do this? Well, from our training that we do, which um, I could name a couple of training, they learn how to make and break connections, hoist pipe, lower pipe, um, they learn all about the circulation system, um, they do a bit of Kelly drilling, you name it. So they are well equipped to work in the industry. Now this curriculum, it's not just for meals. I know um, people tend to think that it's a meal dominated industry. It's not. We have female students as well and they excel just as well as the male students. The Drilling Rig Operations program prepares our students to be employed right after the program. So this means after two years of training of both theory and practical, they are ready to go out into the industry to work. Why? They have seen a rig, they have worked on a rig, and they have worked with a number of different personnel from both their project work and their theory, which they would have had to research. So it's a very lucrative business, the oil and gas industry. It, it's high risk, but it pays well. There's a big incentive for students to work out there and to do the drilling rig operations program because they know that they're gonna be paid well they're going to work really hard, but it's going to pay off in the end. Okay. So, you all may be asking, well, how do I apply to the NESC? We have on our website online applications that we're accepting as of May and walk-in applications at any of our campuses. And we are located in St. Madeline, Point Lisa's, uh, Woodford Lodge and Chicoanas and Tobago for your convenience. Now the prerequisites, you all are tertiary level students, so you all would have met these prerequisites already. All you need to bring in is a completed application form, your bid certificate, a uh, national identification, one passport size photo, a medical certificate of fitness, your academic certificate and copies, you'd be subject to a drug test. Uh, you have to sign up for it if it's a diploma program or if it's self-funded, you don't need to worry about signing up for it and a small registration fee of $300. I wanted to show that NESC also encourages a lot of industry sensitization. So we would, well, prior to the pandemic, I would have taken my electrical class to the power general station and they would have gotten a tour there as well as my auto class they would have gone to lifestyle meetings and this really allows the students to see the industry firsthand uh, ask any questions that they may have and find out about job opportunities and it's really an eye-opening experience to them which i think also strongly motivates them to go back to school and say yes this is what i'm working towards i can't leave out the fact that we like to have fun 
we do have a lot of sports and activities. We go on hikes and we would have done Camp Know Your Country tours. So this photo on the top left would have been taken at the lagoon in Icacos, right? And it was the first time visiting for many of us. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Please, if you have any questions, feel free. And I also left my email address at the bottom of the screen. So you all could email me directly any questions and be happy to answer them. Uh, thank you, uh, Vanessa. Uh, we do have a couple of questions in the chat. So one participant asks, how long is the Weldon program and when does the next cycle begin? Okay. So all of our diploma programs are for two years and the craftsman level programs are for one year. The next cycle is started to start in September, but we are accepting applications as early as May. Okay, thank you. Um, and final question, uh, are there any courses in the field of social work? Social work, you would not get courses in the field of social work within NESC, unfortunately, right? We, we are really focused on energy industry and technical skills and social work would fall in the softer skills category. Okay, thanks, uh, Miss James. Uh, uh, one participant, sorry, to the last uh, question. Ask if you can display your email information once more. No problem. Let me put it in the chat. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for being here. Take care. Okay, so thank you, Miss James, for your presentation once again. Uh, jumping right into Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, and Suriname, current energy climate, we have with us Xavier Moon, the Exploration Manager at Touchstone Exploration Limited. Mr. Moonan has over 15 years of experience working as a petroleum geologist, exploration, development, and operations in all of the sedimentary basins in sub and sub-basins onshore and offshore Trinidad and Tobago. His professional experience includes work with geo services, Slumberger, former state-owned Petrochen, and UK-based gas company, Centria Energy. In addition to his role at Touchstone, he supports the Petroleum Engineering Program at the University of Trinidad and Tobago and the Petroleum Geoscience Program at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus through lectures. Mr. Moonan is widely recognized regionally for his structural mapping and restoration techniques of the Middle Miocene Herrera deep water turbidities, which are the primary reservoir targets of Touchstone's Oitea block. Mr. Munan served as a region delegate treasurer and vice president for the American Association of Petroleum Geologists, Latin America and Caribbean region, LACR, and currently serves as the president-elect for AAPG LACR. He served as president of the Geological Society of Trinidad and Tobago and as governor of the 20th Caribbean Geological Conference, APG Geoscience Technology Workshops, Trinidad and Tobago, APG GTW Guyana, APG GTW Suriname, APG SE Caribbean and Guyana Basins Virtual Symposium, and APG. Caribbean Technical Symposium and ENP Summit. Mr. Moonan is also a member of the Euro European Association of Geoscientists and Engineers and Houston Geological Society, Geological Society of America and the Society of Petroleum Engineers. In 2021, he was awarded the AAPG Grover E. Murray Distinguished Educator Award. Mr. Moonan holds a bachelor's degree in geology from the University of the West Indies Mona campus in Jamaica and a master's degree in structural geology with geophysics from the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom. Welcome, Mr. Moonan. 
Hi, um, afternoon or good morning, depending on wherever you are. Um, thank you for having me. And um, yeah, so very long um, introduction. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to basically share with you all today um, a snapshot, eight, eight slides of what really defined my career so far in um, oil and gas. And I, I'm just on the edge of like exiting young professional sort of phase, right? So clutching onto it. But um, yeah, I would like to show you all like what I've, what I've actually at first hand gone through in this industry. As you all know, it's a very much cyclic industry. If you hadn't pictured that up by now, you know how cyclic it is and we're starting to go back up again, right? So it's all about how do you ride these waves? in this industry and, um, and capitalize um, on every event in these waves, right? So I like to, yeah, you go to the next slide, please. I like to, to, um, to um, chart my career through um, with the uh, West Texas Intermediate oil price, right? As a, as a sort of backdrop. Um, so, I mean, my, my roots, I grew up literally in the oil field, right? I, I knew about it. I was always into dinosaurs and stuff. And my initial thoughts when I was five years old, telling um, my preschool teachers and stuff that I wanted to be like a paleontologist and stuff, right? I, I didn't really think about getting into oil and gas. I respected it. I loved it. I liked the fact that, you know, the, the country made quite a lot of money on it. But even in those days, in the early days, I mean, the oil price, as you can see from like 1990s all the way up to 2000s is fairly flat, right? And um, all of the exciting stuff sort of happens a bit later on. But yeah, oil prices have an, a direct impact, right? On our um, choices and stuff as, um, as citizens in this part of the region, especially now that um, we're, we're very much a hot spot um, for, for oil and gas, right? So keep that in mind that, you know, as these cycles um, go up and go down, you know, it's going to have an impact on not just you, but actually the economies of, of, um, of this part of the world, right? Next. So um, I eventually, um, I guess through the fact that I liked doing outdoorsy kind of stuff. My father was a geography teacher. I actually decided, well, I would pursue a degree in geology, more so actually to become a paleontologist. But then everything changed when I got a two to three month um, internship at Petrotrin. And it actually changed um, you know, towards the oil and, oil and gas industry. I, I literally, um, by luck, if anything, got, got this internship. And, um, and I got a chance to interact with and, uh, and meet with a lot of um, folks of varied backgrounds in the oil company, right? Folks who started off um, in service companies, um, folks in drilling. And luckily these folks were all great mentors. They all just, you know, wanted to show me everything that it do. And so I lived and breathed the oil field for two to three months. And after that, I was like, I don't want to be anywhere else. I just love this, right? It's so exciting. Um, so I, I pursued that and I got a chance to do my, my undergraduate thesis with, um, with Petrotrin. And uh, yeah, so I was all pretty much excited. I have a degree now, I'm graduating. Of course, I must feel some sort of entitlement, like um, I should get a job, right? I'm straight out of school. Well, that doesn't happen. And I've seen like in the chat, you know, a lot of folks, you, you, yeah, you do these courses and degrees and stuff and you still feel like, well, someone's got to help me get a job, right? It's not like that, right? You've got to fight your way through. You have to, to pursue your interests, right? If you want a, a job in these fields, you have to find a way to make yourself set aside from the rest of the of folks um, pursuing these degrees. Because the reality is it's, um, it's a very competitive industry, right? Oil price is going up and we are all um, anticipating more and more drilling to take place, more and more jobs to be available. 
And yeah, that, that's great. But when there is a fall again, it's the folks in the companies who basically um, are more all-rounded, are more passionate, are more dedicated to you know, working through the rough times that the company is gonna um, basically hold on to, right? So it is very competitive. Um, and just to show you, like I, I saw an ad in, an, in the newspaper back then, right? Asking for an operations manager in a company I applied, right? Of course, I have no qualifications to be an operations manager, but it just so happened that who I applied to, they called me up and told me, well, they actually do have persons or positions for, for my sort of role. So I got an interview and the next thing I knew, I was um, mud logging. On, um, on an expiration well. Next. So yeah, you know, your career path is, is um, yeah, can you hit next again? Next slide, yeah. Yeah, so your career path is never really a, a straight line, right? You, you've gotta keep, uh, you gotta keep um, finding um, what's, what's needed next in the industry. So I always tell people, well, you know what? When you realize what your weaknesses are, which takes a time, takes some time to actually realize and come to terms with the fact that I am not as good in this part of my job or part of my field, or I'm, you know, when you realize those things, that's what you need to put yourself into. You've got to basically work on those weak points, right? Challenge yourself, get out of your comfort zone, right? So I, yeah, I got into this job in, in, in Petrin. I was doing exploration geology. That was not what I thought I was actually signing up myself for. I was so used to the fact that um, we were doing all of these development wells and stuff in my undergrad thesis. It was busy. It was like drilling every day. Exploration is a lot different, right? It's a, it's a long-term sort of project, right? Sometimes these things go on for you know, five, 10 years sometimes to, to, to eventually lead to the actual drilling and development. So it wasn't really what I thought it would have been like, but then I realized that, you know, I could learn a lot from the situation. I could learn about uh, maybe the geology of larger basins and fields, right? Instead of working on a smaller area. So I got a chance to work alongside other multinationals and you know you look for those opportunities to build yourself up, right? Um, I got involved with, um, with societies like the Geological Society of Trinidad and Tobago. I eventually am involved with the Society of Petroleum Engineers as well too. I realized that, you know, probably at this point in time, I could actually um, pursue a degree in structural geology because I realized that for me, my passion was geology. It might not be the same for you all, right? But I found that this was something that I saw that working in um, this field requires, right? And I felt like I needed to build on that. And so I pursued a degree, uh, a master's degree in Leeds. And, um, and I researched an oil field right here from Trinidad, um, published it. And lo and behold, that actually becomes, you know, a, a great stepping stone for, for many projects that I did after thereafter. Right. Next, we we'll go to the next slide. So yeah, there was that big crash, right? And, um, you know, of course, you know, a lot of projects would have been stalled everywhere. So it was an opportune time to basically just like, look for something to, um, to do during that time that would then prepare myself for when the next up cycle begins again. So the next up cycle begins and basically I'm taking on more projects. I'm trying to mentor people. Mentoring is great because it, not only you helping other folks, but actually you continue to train yourself over and over to be able to be a better mentor. Right. And so I started like even taking up um, lectureship roles at universities and, uh, and coordinating events with like uh, groups like the AAPG. Those are events, yes, but more so they're great in the, um, networking uh, sessions, right? Um, true coordinating 
uh, even one of those events, you get to interact with people from, you know, a whole wide range of, um, of companies. And I found that like, sometimes it's good to get your name out there, just so people know that when they hear your name, they're like, oh yeah, I know that person. I met them at so-and-so, or I worked with them on this, um, on this event or something, right? So it, 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 sent, it's, it helps build that familiarity, right? Just to get your name out and so people know you. So when eventually your CV lands on their desk, they're like, I know something about this person already, right? It, it helps. It helps because tying in with what Dax was saying, it's not only just about your grades, right? It's the attitude of the person because they would know what your attitude was like for any of those events, right? And if you're basically uh, helping to, to, to bring people together, to share ideas, grow the science and stuff, they know that your mind is in the right place. Your passion is there. It's, it's, it, it, you reek of passion, basically, right? Um, so yeah, we had an upturn um, in the cycle at this point from 2009, going all the way through to like 2014 or so. I, um, I embarked on other projects like at um, British-based Centrica, who we were exploring on the North Coast area. Um, I decided to like step into a totally different basin, different data sets, great seismic, and do things that I probably couldn't have done with the data sets I had before. So that way I grew my geophysics part or yeah, part of me, right? Which may not have been uh, my strong points before. And, um, and yeah, so I got exposed to that. And um, yeah, I also got married too. So that's, that's, you know, that's a big step for anybody as well too. So you're taking, you know, you're pacing these sort of events um, in your career and also punctuating your, your social life as well too into it and how you have to balance that, that sort of thing. And you would like as an oil and gas professional to, you know, obviously um, have, a, have a very smooth um, life going forward, but yeah, challenges come up, right? And as you can see, we're just going to enter another down cycle again. So next. Next, yeah. So, um, so we entered another down cycle, and it was, it was, a, a, it was. Uh, I knew that that in true interacting with a lot of the young folks, the young professionals and stuff, a lot of folks were dismayed, right? Because um, you know they are under the impression that you know, you know, the 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 the, the world was seeing a, a fairly. Um, growing um, and upturning and in the oil price and there was a lot of opportunities coming up and yeah they had their mindset that they would enter an oil company and just create their careers from there going forward but of course with that crash you know you have a lot of folks who are who are then again um, unsettled as to their future so I decided to like um, help folks like that by you know trying to introduce them to the industry in different ways right so visiting um well sites um having company tours um those kinds of things they're all helping to, to basically expose folks to other parts of the industry and meet people it's all about meeting people right um, and then uh, some other challenges I faced. Well, my company, we were able, able to sell our assets in Trinidad um, to Shell. And well, of course, the company closes its doors in Trinidad. So I had to figure out other things, right? I had a child at this point in time too. So how do you balance those things? You've got, uh, you've got a lot more challenges pounding on you and then the oil price isn't great, right? Um, so I took up um, lecturing uh, full time at that at that point um, with UE. I was part time lecturing before. Started doing more research, coming up with other technologies to apply to the industry. The good thing was was that I worked with the industry a bit before, so I know what the industry is sort of like crying out for, and try to like come up with solutions that could then be reapplied back. Right. 
to the industry. Um, continued to, to work with um, uh, regional bodies and coordinate events because this is how you get your name out there and you just keep, um, keep trying. And I like the statement, right? You may be rejected a hundred times, but all you really need is just one job offer, right? And so you just keep pounding that door. You just need one offer to get you in and you will um, build your career from there, right? Next. Right, so, um, so while at UWE, I also began consulting uh, with some companies. And then I was offered um, a role with um, Touchstone, um, who happened to be exploring for the mid Miocene Herreras, which 10 years or so before that, I had actually done my MSC thesis on, right? And, um, and they you know, wanted me on board to, um, to work with them to do this exploration. So I worked with them. We, uh, we, I was brought on board eventually as exploration manager. Uh, we drilled a lot of successful wells so far, right? Uh, we have, um, and, and so far that's been going great. I still, just because I've gotten this role, I'm not like, you know, um, you know set, um, get settled and, and get too comfortable, right? I, always looking for other things to, to engage with, to build myself. So I'm, I'm still supporting disaster preparedness groups with other stuff. I'm still um, working with the SB and the APG and, and Houston George Society and EAG and all of these groups, right? I still lectured you, yeah, I still lectured you, DT. I still have a child, I still have a family to look after as well, but you, you realize that you need all of these um, components, right? To basically um, just continue to, yeah, build, build yourself, right? Expose yourself to more things. So you then realize what you might be weaker in and then seek out um, solutions. Um, and yeah, uh, and you don't need to always come up with a unique idea, right? Sometimes there's, I, great ideas being applied elsewhere in the world. I, I'm not saying that you have to copy the idea, but you can you can work with the idea and then see if that works in in in, in your issues, right? Your um your your problems. So you know, read those um those publications. Um, check out the uh the 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 um APG SBE groups especially um. And look at what they're posting. Look at the, some of the new science coming out and see does any of that um, could be applied? Can any of that be applied to, to Trinidad, to Suriname, to Guyana, anywhere? And, um, and see what are the problems. Delve into some of the issues that you see that companies are having. And maybe you come up with a solution that sparks someone's in, in the company's interest and they might call you up, right? Um, so try and try again. Always be an optimist, okay? And here, are a whole bunch of projects that I've, I've worked on, yeah. Next, I think there's a final slide after this, yeah. And um, we're back on an upturn, so. Okay, thanks again. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the modeling of the mud volcano that we did, um, modeling our crops and stuff as well, too, which interestingly no one did before, but you know, it's actually quite simple. Yeah, okay, hit next again. Yeah, so just summarizing all of those um, um, key points, right? Um, Sometimes all you have to do is just think what nobody has thought before, right? Um, and that doesn't mean you have to come up with a unique solution, a unique idea. Maybe it's what no one has thought before to this problem in front of you, right? Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave you with that. I've got all these nice points that are, are sort of like... Um, I found inspired me. And sometimes some of those were things I 
people said to me or I heard along the way or, or so, but um, hope that was inspiring a little bit. And um, here is a flare in the middle of Trinidad, a place where no one thought they would ever see a gas flare before, right? And, um, and yeah, so sometimes you just have to think about what no one has thought of. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Moore, for your presentation. Uh, what really stood out to me was the point you made about uh, you can try a hundred times and fail, but you just need one opportunity to succeed. Uh, we have one question in the chat here, Director T. Uh, someone asks, can a craftsman program from NESC Drilling Academy get you a job at Touchstone? Well, let me tell you something. We do quite a lot of things at Touchstone. And yeah, I, I wasn't here to necessarily like speak about Touchstone particularly. Right? But yeah, um, for instance, right? So as you know, Touchstone is exploring onshore Trinidad. There's lots of roads and bridges that um, are necessary for our exploration and development. We build our own bridges, literally from scratch. So I'm sure um, we, uh, we, we have folks and, and we need folks for stuff like that, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, thanks again, Mr. Munan, for your presentation. Okay, uh, I'd just like to remind the participants that during each speaker's presentation, feel free to send any question that you have in the chat and we will answer them to the best of our ability at the end of the presentations. Uh, next, we have our safety moment. Sorry, we had our safety moment earlier, and in all things, safety comes first. As such, it's fitting that we touch on safety within the oil and gas industry. And we have with us Jamal Allen, the HSSC manager at Rams Logistics. Jamal, over to you. Good morning, everyone. And um, first of all, thanks to Eldorado Oxshaw and UTT for having me. Just getting the presentation up. So as our host indicated, my name is Jamal Allen and I am the HSSEF manager for Ramps Logistics. I have been in the oil and gas industry for the better part of 14 years, spending some of that in downstream operations, such as in process plants, as well as a considerable amount of time in upstream drilling onshore for drilling contractors and operators in the oil and gas industry. So my topic for today is simple for you all, choose safety. But first it's important for us to understand what safety is. Throughout your careers in the oil and gas industry, you would hear two key terms on a very frequent basis, safety, and hazard. So what is safety? Safety is, de is defined as the state of being free from harm or danger. What is a hazard? A hazard is any source of potential damage, harm, or adverse health effects on something or someone. Basically, a hazard is a potential for harm or an adverse effect. For example, to people as health effects, to organization, as property or equipment losses, or to the environment. It's important as prospective employees in the oil and gas industry that you understand the key differences between personal and process safety. Not all hazards are the same or can cause equal consequences. Personal or occupational hazards usually involve incidents such as slips and falls, cuts, burns, and vehicular accidents. And most times they affect one worker at a time. Process safety hazards, however, may cause major incidents involving releases of potential, potentially dangerous materials, fires or explosions, catastrophic effects, multiple injuries and fatalities, and substantial economic property and environmental damage. 
Next, I'd like to share with you a very short video of a process safety incident that had a catastrophic effect. It is our gas well blowout in Oklahoma that happened in 2018 during routine onshore drilling operations that ended the lives of four or five workers. January 21st, 2018, the Prior Trust gas well located in Pittsburgh County, Oklahoma. Crew members from the Patterson UTI Drilling Company had been drilling the well for over a week under the oversight of Red Mountain Operating, LLC. At 3.36 p.m., the Patterson crew stopped drilling. They did so because they planned to remove the drill pipe from the well and change the drill bit. At 6.48 p.m., crew members started to remove the drill pipe from the well bore. During this operation, called tripping, mud is pumped into the well with the intent to replace the volume of drill pipe being removed. This is meant to prevent gas from flowing into the well. The well was a horizontal well with a vertical section and a lateral section. By 10.30 p.m., the end of the drill pipe had been removed from the lateral section and reached the top of the curve in the well. The Patterson crew then pumped what is known as a pill of weighted fluid into the well, intended to prevent gas from flowing into the well below the pill. By 1.12 a.m. the next day, January 22nd, the crew started to remove the drill pipe from the vertical section of the well. But drilling crew members found that the drill pipe being removed from the vertical section had not drained and still contained mud. The Patterson crew attempted to pump a weighted slug of mud into the drill pipe to push the mud out of the drill pipe, but this was not successful as the pipe was plugged. The crew continued working, and by 6.10 a.m., the drill pipe and bottom hole assembly, including the drill bit, were completely removed, and the blind rams on the well's blowout preventer were closed. At 7.57 a.m., the blind rams were reopened so that a new bottom hole assembly could be lowered into the well. At 8.09 a.m., mud was pumped through the bottom hole assembly to test the new equipment. Between 7.57 a.m. and 8.35 a.m., while the drilling crew was testing the equipment, the drilling rig's mud pits gained 107 barrels of mud. Mud pit gains are an indication there could be a gas influx in the well as mud is pushed out of the well and into the mud pits. The CSB obtained and is analyzing data that shows conditions existed that could have allowed gas to enter into the well during the tripping operation. At 8.35 a.m., with testing complete, the bottom hole assembly was removed from the well. At that time, a crew member observed mud flowing up out of the open blowout preventer stack. A minute later, at 8.36 a.m., mud blew upwards out of the well. The gas and mud from the well ignited, causing a large fire. Five people were killed. The blowout continued for hours until a well control services company was able to successfully shut in the well around 4 p.m. January 21st. January so as you can see in this incident, a major process safety failure. Some key issues coming out of the investigation was that there was poor barrier management, unbalanced operations, performed with all proper planning, procedures and needed equipment, signs of influx either not identified or inadequately responded to, the alarm systems were shut off, flow checks were not conducted, there were gaps in the safety management system, the driller's cabin design was not ideal, the BOP could not close due to burned hydraulic hoses, and there was a lack of safety requirements by regulations. The image you are seeing on your screen here is a still of a video that was captured of the fire on that rig which they said burned for hours. And you will be asking yourself, Jamal, well, this happened in Oklahoma. What does that have to do with Trinidad or Guyana? I could tell you from experience, my very first leadership role in the oil and gas industry, I was promoted to the team lead of the HSC department for a drilling company in 2015. 
And the first two months of that job, I had to respond to a similar incident. But in this case on the drilling rig, the returns came back up on the mud tank and the fire started there. So they were able to shut in the well in time to save the entire rig mass. Unfortunately, no one was on the drill on the mud tank at the time of the fire. The rig crew with fire trained personnel would have used anywhere upwards of 10 to 15 fire extinguishers trying to battle that fire in the mud tank. Eventually we had to call in Petrotron and Superior Fire Services to extinguish the blaze in a couple of hours. But the reality is these incidents do happen. And the findings of this incident was similar to the findings of the incident that I experienced in 2015. Luckily, there was no fatalities then. But that's the realities of the industry we work in, the industry you all desire to work in, and how critical it is to work safe and be safe at all times. Now you may be asking yourself, Jamal, how can I, as a new employee, first time job in the oil and gas industry, contribute to preventing incidents such as this? And it's very simple. In order to control hazards, we first need to identify them. And as employees in the oil and gas industry, all we ask is that you use your senses first and foremost, at least four out of the five. So your sight, one of the easiest ways for anyone to identify a hazard is to see it. You can also hear it. Hazards can also be heard. A once quiet area that is now loud or vice versa is cause for concern. Smell, in process industries, especially drilling, the scent of hydrocarbons, in some cases, the lack of smell can be fatal. This is true for H2S. When you're working in drilling operations, H2S is present. H2S smells like rotten eggs, but in higher concentration, it eventually kills your sense of smell, and that as well could lead to fatalities. And touch, feeling a surface that is usually cool, that is now hot, or even excessive vibration can be a, a sign of potential abnormality or hazard. So what is your role in all of this? One, compliance. HSE compliance with laws, standards, company policies, procedures, etc. Stay alert while on the job. Raise alarms and report unsafe conditions. Report incidents. Call out coworkers on unsafe practices or process deviations. Ask questions. Know your limitations. Seek clarity when unsure and exercise your stop work authority and right to refuse work. Most times, if it looks unsafe, it is unsafe. If you see something, say something or do something. You may be wondering what is the role of an HSE practitioner like myself? The role of HSE includes what is not limited to development of HSE management systems and auditing of those systems, risk management, training, ensuring compliance and enforcement, advice on legal requirements, advice on emergency management procedures, developing SOPs and work instructions, incident investigations, workplace inspections, and monitoring KPIs. For those of you who have an interest in working in the oil and gas industry, there are a few certifications you could look at to either one, boost your resume, as someone who would like to come in as an engineer or a driller, floor hand, et cetera, or somebody who would genuinely like to come in as an, HNA, as an HSE officer or advisor into the oil and gas industry. So the first one we have here is OSHA, and that's out of the United States. This is an internationally recognized certification. You can do the OSHA 10 or 30 hour general industry outreach program. So the 10 hour training is primarily intended for entry level workers like yourself. The 30 hour training, however, is intended to provide workers with some safe responsibilities, a greater depth and variety of training. All outreach trainings is intended to cover an overview of the hazards a worker may encounter on a job site. Training emphasizes hazard identification, avoidance, control and prevention, but not OSHA standards. We also have IOSH. IOSH is out of the UK, and IOSH working safely is also a good supplemental certificate that you could put on your resumes. 
Working safely is for people at any level in any sector worldwide who need a grounding in the essentials of safety and health. Working safely covers an outline of occupational safety and health, defining hazards and risk, identifying common hazards, and improving safety performance. And last but not least, we have NABOSH. This is also out of the UK. And this is for anyone who is interested in becoming an HSE practitioner. This is a very good place to start. So the NABOSH certificate will give you invaluable knowledge and skills and a globally respected qualification. This qualification is relevant to every workplace, ideal for anybody with health and safety management responsibilities, and perfect for those embarking on a health and safety career. The NABOSH National General Certificate covers how to effectively manage health and safety, how to identify and control workplace hazards, and how to measure if you've been successful. And it also extensively covers UK's key legal requirements. Now, for those of you interested in these certifications, for example, the OSHA 10 and 30 hour, as well as the IOSH working safely, can be done online at your own pace and your own time over a specific amount of months or weeks. The NABOSH, however, is done in person and there are a variety of schools that offer the NABOSH certification, such as, such as NSAFE. Um, I'm not sure in Guyana who currently offers the NABOSH certification at present, but this certification does take a period of approximately six months and it is a bit costly. So it's really recommended for those who have an interest of going into the health and safety field altogether. So in closing, why choose safety? Because it's always better than the alternative. Thank you all very much for your time and for listening. Any questions? Okay, thank you, Jamal, for your presentation. Uh, we do have a question in the chat. Someone indicated that they would have finished their degree and they wanted to know what should they do to improve their chances of getting hired. Finish their degree in health and safety? Yeah, it would have been in health and safety. Right, so a good place to start is looking at a professional membership. So there are a number of options you can look at. For example, um, if you did a bachelor's degree um, with schools such as SBCS, for example, or even an environmental degree with UE, um, you could look at getting a grad IOSH accreditation from IOSH. So basically, once you have finished a bachelor's degree, you could apply to IOSH to be a professional member and you would have grad IOSH status. That goes a long way in showing recruiters and employers that you have that professional certification. When you have professional certification, you are forced to do something called a CPD or continuous professional development. What that means is if, for example, you did your degree in 2020, between 2020 and 2022, for the last two years, you probably would not have done any other sort of HSC certification, training or learning. But with a CPD, continuous professional development, with professional memberships, you are forced to do that in order to maintain your certification of grad IOSH. So what that shows your employers is that you are continuously learning and you're continuously developing, as well it helps you network to expand your knowledge base on a regular basis. So I'll definitely advise anyone seeking employment and not just in HSC, but in any field whatsoever, look towards joining a professional body. Okay, thank you. Uh, one final question for you, Ms. Allen. Uh, someone wanted to find out, does the NABOSH certificate expire? No, it doesn't. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, thanks so again, Ms. Allen, for your presentation on safety. Thank you. Uh, next, we will move into our next segment. Renewable energy and the energy transition are two fundamental transformations and are emerging trends that enable a revamping of the energy landscape and progress towards continuous energy efficiency improvements. With us today, we have the infamous passionate energy analyst, Nisha Ramdas, founder of Energy TT. Hi, and good morning to everybody. Thank you for that introduction, Adrian. So um, today, I know we've all signed up for this um, virtual career fair, 
related to oil and gas, but we're in the year 2022 and you would hear the term energy transition, renewable energy um, popping up quite a lot. So I'm here today to explain exactly what that means and how it fits in to Trinidad and Tobago. I'll be using Trinidad and Tobago as a case study. So um, this is my presentation. Feel free to ask any questions in the chat bar. I'll be um, sure to answer them at the end. So we're here to make the world a better place. And how are we going to do that? Through the energy transition. So what's on the agenda for today? Um, the first thing we'd like to cover is what is renewable energy? We wanna know why choose renewable energy? Um, as I said, I'll be using Trinidad and Tobago as a case study. So I'll be talking about Trinidad and Tobago's renewable energy commitments. Um, what are the barriers to renewable energy and the way forward for us? And of course, at the end, I'll definitely have a question and answer session with you guys. So firstly, renewable energy. What is renewable energy? Um, renewable energy is often called clean energy because it comes from natural sources or processes that are constantly replenished. In other words, it's sustainable and it's something that can't run out or it's endless. So for example, the sun will keep shining, wind will keep blowing, waves will keep crashing. And even if their availability depends on time and weather, these things will still keep happening. So there are different types of renewable energy. So the first and most common you'll see um, would be solar. So um, in the case of solar, you'll see solar PV devices, um, these solar panels, solar cells, and they basically change sunlight directly into electricity. Another common type of renewable energy you would see is wind energy. And what actually happens there is that the wind turns, turns the turbines, which therefore would create um, more energy and it would feed into an electric generator, therefore producing electricity. Another common type of renewable energy in the Caribbean, because we do have volcanoes, is geothermal energy. So by harnessing the natural heat below the Earth's surface, because we know below the Earth's surface is hot, right? Geothermal energy can be used to heat homes directly, or it can be used to generate electricity. Three other types of um, renewable energy we're going to cover today is hydro, um, also referred to as hydroelectric energy. And this is where a large reservoir of water, um, most commonly a dam, can be used to create a controlled flow of water. And that will then drive a turbine, because remember there's motion, kinetic energy, and that would therefore generate electricity. Another form of hydro um, energy would be tidal. And that is where tidal currents that happen twice a day will then drive turbine generators. The third type of um, renewable energy would include biomass. So biomass would be plant material, wood, et cetera. And they like burn this biomass and that is then changed into chemical energy and it's released as heat, which can then generate electricity with a steam turbine. Now you might think if you're burning energy, if you're burning biomass, right, would that not contribute to carbon emissions? It does, but it is way less than if we were to burn fossil fuels, right? So what are the benefits of this renewable energy that we always hear everyone talking about? So the first thing we'd like to talk about is less emissions. So we all know of greenhouse gases, the greenhouse effect and climate change. We've all seen it happening in the world. We've sat down and we've been like, oh my gosh, why is it so hot? Or even those in um, temperate regions or even in North America, Europe, they have really, really bad winters, right? Climate change is happening. So in order to get less emissions and contribute less to you know, a bigger carbon footprint, we wanna generate electricity that produces no greenhouse gas emissions or less greenhouse gas emissions. And that would also therefore decrease air pollution. Energy security, now this is a big one and this applies to most energy producing nations such as Trinidad and Tobago. Oil and gas fossil fuels are a non-renewable resource, which means that it can run out. Our economy depends on the sale of oil, gas, and its derivatives. So if this is going to run out, what is going to be the state of our economy? We've seen a decline in oil and gas production lately, and it has been affecting our economy negatively, right? 
So if we were now to diversify our energy mix and use renewables instead of just using oil and gas, and we use all of the mentioned above, then that way we could guarantee a more sustainable use of our fossil fuel supply and therefore sustain our economy. The, sec the third thing we wanna talk about is environmental sustainability. Fossil fuels damage our environment. So therefore using renewable energy responsibly would be better for plants, animals, and the planet in general. And fourthly, this is a really big point, especially for everyone tuned in. It creates new opportunities. So by establishing this new renewable energy sector, we're creating economic development and jobs in manufacturing, installation, and much, much more. So as I previously mentioned, we'll be using Trent Tobago as a case study today, right? So these are the energy targets with regards to renewable energy and alternative forms of energy. So the first would be carbon reduction. So in Trinidad and Tobago, we are focused on three main emitting sectors. These sectors are what are responsible for our, like the major output of, of carbon emissions in our country, right? The first would be power generation, the second would be transport, and the third would be the petrochemical industry. So another thing that everyone would hear about is the 2015 um, Paris Agreement. And that is this COP, it's a uh, uh, United Nations party that um, basically everyone comes in and they make, every country makes commitments to how they're going to reduce the effects of climate change on the planet. And this contribution that they make, it's called a nationally determined contributions. And this is something that we will be held accountable for, right? So the first thing would be 15% um, a reduction in our total carbon emissions, and then a 30% reduction in emissions by 2030 in the transportation sector. The third thing that we want to talk about, and this was mentioned in the budget by our Minister of Finance, I believe it was in the year either 2016 or 2017, where a commitment was made by our government saying that by the year 2021, there should be a 10% electricity generation from renewable energy. Now we're in the year 2022, and we've seen that, you know, not much has happened. So let's move on to the next slide and we could talk more about that. So why isn't there this big transition to renewable energy that we hear people talking about all the time? Why isn't it happening as it should be happening in Trinidad especially? So in Trinidad, the first thing we want to talk about is subsidies. So despite us thinking that our fuel price is really high right now, remember our fuel and electricity were subsidized at one point. So we would have had one of the cheapest fuel rates in the world. And in the Western Hemisphere, we would have had one of the cheapest electricity rates at four US cents per kilowatt hour. So if we're getting electricity so cheap because we're an oil and gas producing nation, there's really no incentive for anyone to diversify our energy mix into renewables, right? A second thing we wanna talk about is policy and legislation. There's a lack of supporting legal and regulatory framework for renewable energy um, into the grid in Trinidad. So basically, Tech has control over the whole grid and if any laws or regulations or policies aren't put in place, then therefore it's illegal for us to put power back onto the grid essentially. So if you want to become a renewable household, you will have to come completely off grid, which may be expensive for, for most because we have to look into battery storage and those kind of things. This one I would say is the most applicable and the most major concern for us as a society, public education and awareness. We've all heard the technical terms, we've all heard the, the long words and the jargon, but do we really understand what it means? Do we really understand how it's affecting our planet, how it's affecting our livelihoods, how it's affecting our households, right? We need to generally educate the public in a way where it's understandable to them so that they can now be proactive 
instead of just waiting for a policy to come to them or a policy to say, okay, you need to do X, Y, Z. People will now take, a, take it upon themselves to say, okay, let me be a little more energy efficient at home. Let, let me switch off my lights. Let me do this because at the end of the day, X, Y, Z is happening to the planet, right? Fourthly, the abundance of fossil fuels, right? So this is a big thing in Trinidad. Since like from ever, a hundred years we've been into oil and gas, right? And some would refer to us as being spoiled. We got so accustomed to the lifestyle that oil and gas provides for us. And because of the abundance of the fossil fuels over the years, we haven't made any long-term or proactive plan to transition to cleaner energy fuels because we say, okay, this has been working for us thus far. You know, we don't need to change. If it's not broke, don't fix it. But unfortunately, it is being broken over time and we definitely need to fix it. So what is the way forward, you might ask? What can be done? So we touched on legislation before. We need to change this legislation. So we need to reform the TNTEC Act. We need to implement feed-in tariffs, net metering, all these things to make actually implementing renewable systems into our homes easier, less hassle, and it's, you know, we want it to be legal. We don't want to be doing anything illegal, right? So the second thing we're going to talk about as well is financial incentives. Who doesn't love to, to get a little rebate, a little money back on whatever they're doing in their homes, right? So if we sweeten the deal a little bit, especially for companies, organizations, businesses, they will be encouraged to invest more in renewable energy. Public education. Should we not start running education and awareness campaigns from small? And I know that a lot of people in my age, age category, I'm not that old, but a couple of people in my age category would agree that the only time we heard or start hearing about renewable energy and alternative forms of energy would have been later on in our school career. And we don't want that to be something that's sustained. We want it to be a culture that's developed from small because we don't want this big stick mentality, but we have to tell big people, okay, switch off your lights, take off your AC while you're not using it, right? We want it to be children in preschool, primary school, they enter recycling, they enter conserving energy. And, you know, they could then come to their parents and say, mommy, you know, I learned this at school today or daddy, I learned this at school today. Let's take off our lights or let's, you know, open your windows with some fresh air instead of using the AC. So public education is a pivotal in this transition to renewable energy. This one, this last one would be very unpopular. So please do not hate me for saying it but we need to reduce subsidies. So by reducing the subsidy on electricity, citizens would now have to pay more for electricity, right? And I know that might sound bad and it might say, oh my God, how are we gonna afford this? But by doing that, it would prevent wastage but because we, we pay next to nothing for electricity. Man, people living on their lights all night in the front porch, they're running the AC whole day, they're washing clothes five days to the week. If my mom is watching this, please know that I'm directing this to her. You can't keep doing these things, right? We need to conserve electricity. We can't waste it. So we need to find cheaper alternatives. And by investing in renewables in the long run, this would be a lot easier on our pockets. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, I hope I was able to shed some light on renewables. And I hope I was able to spread some awareness and you know, get your brain thinking. If anybody has any questions for me, feel free to send it via the chat. Okay, thank you, uh, Nisha, for that presentation and educating us on the intimate connection between renewable energy and sustainable development. Uh, we do have a question in the chat here directed to you. Uh, someone asks, why doesn't Trinidad and Tobago start using nuclear energy? Is there any potential for nuclear energy in TNT? Okay, so firstly, let me state my MBA was in sustainable energy management. I tried to stay away from the nuclear topic as much as I could, right? Um, it's something that's very controversial. I don't think the potential for it was explored in Trinidad when studies were done 
to find what was the most applicable type of renewable energy in Trinidad. Obviously, it would be solar and wind based off of our um, geographic location. So with regards to nuclear, I'm afraid I'm not, I'm not equipped to comment on that, but I think our best options moving forward would definitely be solar and wind. Okay, thanks so much, Nisha. Uh, we have one more question in the chat. Uh, what are your thoughts on the energy sector, not only in Trinidad, but around the world, knowing people are leaning towards not only solar energy and greener energy? So um, it's not just like, I would say it's not just governments or um, countries leading towards it. It is actual companies that have made commitments to uphold going net zero or zero carbon emissions by most of them by 2040, BP has done it, Shell has done it, Total has done it. So it's the way forward. There is no way we could sustain a world of fossil fuel usage and not damage the planet to the extent it was damaged, right? So this is definitely something that needs to be adopted more, especially in small island developing states such as Trinidad, because we are the ones who are going to feel the effects of climate change, right? We've seen islands flooded out because, you know, rising sea levels. So this is definitely something that needs to be adopted, not just by governments and countries, but by organizations as well. Okay, and final question uh, directed to you, given your uh, study in, sorry, given the uh, knowledge that you have in renewable energy, and the degree and stuff that you would have done, someone wanted to know where in Trinidad can someone study renewable energy specifically? This is actually a great question. So back in my day, again, I'm not old, but back in my day, there were very few organizations offering it, right? But at the time, I know for sure there is UE offering degrees in it as well as master's programs in it as UTT offering it as well. I did my MBA at Lockjack. Um, there are a number of, there's CETAL, there's different organizations in Trinidad and Tobago who are looking into developing this renewable energy capacity. But don't just limit yourself to local institutions or universities because what COVID-19 has shown us is that we've changed the way of doing things, right? So now you're getting a lot of courses, a lot of programs, a lot of certificates online. So it's easy to go access for free sometimes. So you could go on Coursera to a renewable energy basics course just to get some general knowledge and it is free to you. So the power is actually in your hands. If you wish to do that, Google is one, it's one search away. Okay, thanks so much Nisha for your advice and your presentation today. All right, so up next we have resume writing interview tips and opportunities onshore and offshore with EDU within the energy sector with Eldorado Offshore's recruitment team. Today we have Shanta Jag Jaglal, uh, Ms. Martha Wickham, Candice Callender, and Seema Misrilal. All right, good morning, everyone. So as mentioned, um, I am Shanta Jaglal. I am one of the human resource officers at Eldorado Offshore. And I must say, it's a pleasure for EDO's HR team to be here with you all and you know, to provide our advice um, on taking that first step towards finding your dream job, as well as showing you how, just how many opportunities are available to you. At Eldorado Offshore, we believe that everyone deserves opportunities. And our aim is to provide these to you in order to build your capacity and your capability within these respective fields. So with this presentation, we aim to assist anyone who wishes to build their careers within the oil and gas industry, um, within the energy sector in general. So with that being said, we'll jump right into it. The first step to getting your next job is to ensure that your resume is on point. So here are some tips to ensure that your resumes impress your future employers. First point, um, we'll run through just the general layout of your resumes. So first thing to note is you need to ensure that your resume is structured 
Um, it must have subheadings. So, you know, you'll start off with your objective. You'll run into your educational background, working experience. Um, you can include sections with your skills and your trainings. And of course, always include your references. Um, the second point I'd like to discuss as well, um, there isn't a requirement to have a photo within your resume. Um, usually uh, during the shortlisting process for EDU and for companies in general, once there's a, a requirement to you know, provide a passport size photo or even an ID card, you know, we'll request those things as needed. Next, uh, ensure that your resume formatting is uniform and it must be visually appealing, of course. So, you know, you can use the same font um, throughout your resume, um, use the same font size and you can, uh, you know, make it a bit bigger for the headings and then the subheadings, um, but just ensure that it's uniform throughout your resume. Also, ensure that your contents are clear and concise. Um, while you want to ensure that as much information is provided within your resume, ensure that you aren't overdoing it with the information, you know, just make sure it's um, compact and it has everything that is necessary. Right, and next we'll move into the type of information that you're including within your resume. So you must, of course, ensure that you list your bio data. This is extremely critical because, um, of course, companies will need to get this information. They must be able to contact you. So, I mean, of course, the basic ensure that your name is there. Um, ensure that you provide a contact, uh, an email address, um, your general address where you live. Um, you know, you can keep it um, general if you um, prefer not to put your full address. All right. So this is absolutely necessary. Next, um, when you're listing your previous positions, um, you know, under your, um, um, your experience, you must, of course, include the duties fulfilled. You don't want to just put, um, you know, the job title that you would have held. Ensure that you have the basic duties you would have completed. You don't need to go too in detail with it, but we just need to get an idea of, you know, what activities you completed to see which jobs you are most applicable for. Right. And uh, of course, for anyone who has little to no experience, that's OK. We understand. And of course, you can include a project section, um, you know, in place of the working experience. And within that project section, you can include any projects that you would have spearheaded, um, any projects that you would have had a big role in um, and just list the activities you would have completed for that. And, you know, what was the outcome of it? All right, and finally, um, tailor it to the specific industry and the job that you're applying for. So um, if you're applying for a particular position, the first thing you want to do, of course, is, you know, just research that um, position, research that general industry, so that you're ensuring the information that's provided within your resume um, is more tailored towards that. Um, of course, uh, you know, a lot of times um, employers would look at this information and this is you know, their first introduction to you. So you want to make sure that you're putting your best foot forward, you're giving them um, exactly what they need within your resume. So I'll move on now to the submission of your resume. Um, you want to ensure that you are proofreading and editing your resume as needed. Um, once you, um, you know, you start a new job, you include that within your resume if you intend to apply for another, um, you know, you... Um, get new projects that are added onto your portfolio at your current job, you add that in as well. Um, so, you know, you keep updating as you go along because you don't want to provide an outdated resume um, where, you know, you're applying for something in 2022, but the last listed job would have ended in um, 2019, you know? Um, yeah, and next, of course, you put the position that you're applying for within your email subject and your cover letter. Um, this is really critical because a lot of times, you know, there are general applications that come through and we want to know if there is something specific that you're interested in. We, we of course, would go through your resume, see your experience and filter you accordingly. But, you know, if you see something that you're interested in and you want to go after it, um, ensure that you put that uh, um, job title or you can put the general um, department or general field that you want to go into. Um, yeah, and next, of course, you include a greeting within your email submission. Um, so, you know, don't just send your resume via email and, you know, leave the body of the email blank. Um, just a general greeting. Um, good day. Um, kindly note that I wish to apply for the position of, uh, um, you know, mechanical engineer um, at Eldorado Offshore. You know, and just, just ensure that there's at least a basic greeting within the email submission. 
um, when you're submitting your resume, this as well is very, very critical. Um, ensure that you have it in a PDF document. Um, you know, it, it, Word documents are acceptable as well, but um, preferably a PDF document. Um, please do not um, type your resume within the body of the email. Um, sometimes we get pictures of resumes um, versus the actual PDF documents. Um, you know, so as much as possible, um, keep it within a, a standard format. Um, and finally, um, you want to try as much as possible to submit a cover letter with your resume. You know, this um, kind of, uh, again, gives the employer that first introduction to you, what's your experience, who you are, and uh, you know, um, it's ideal to at least have a cover letter that's addressed to the company that you're applying for, right? So um, that's pretty much my final tip. Um, thank you very much. I'm gonna pass it over now to my colleague, Seema. She will take you one step further to the interviewing process. Thank you, Shanta, for that very effective resume writing tip. Good morning. My name is Simon Mizralal. I'm also a human resource officer at Eldorado Offshore. Here to brief you on interview tips. Once your application has been successfully shortlisted and you have been called for a job interview, it's important to be prepared. Preparation is crucial. Researching the company is one of the best way to become an outstanding candidate during the hiring process. This can be done by simply per pursuing the company's, perusing the company's website and social media platforms. The About Us page on those websites enable you to discover pertinent details as it relates to the company, the company's mission, vision statements, the key players within the organizations, like the CEO, vice president, departmental managers, um, and other internal managers is important to know. Also, the client, product, and services is a crucial entity. Knowing the value and culture of any organization is crucial. It enables you to discover the skills and, and experiences the employer values most. Cultural fit in any organization is important, especially for the job seeker. It shows it have shown ways that where you are adaptable to the culture of an organization. Just a quick example right here at Eldorado Offshore. Our Vice President, Ms. Serena, empowers our team to be the best version of ourselves, always inspiring, inspiring and motivating us to become solution-oriented persons. This positivity has transferred throughout the organization and enables us to be productive and our personal growth and development within this organization has been instilled to us. In keeping with my point, do your research as it's better prepare you for the potential questions that may arise during the company's operation during the interview. Pre-interview routine. Plan your travel routine effectively and give your ample time to arrive at the company 10 to 15 minutes before scheduled interview time. Whether it may be in person or virtual, be on time. Create a portfolio that all important documents, such as your cover letter, your resume, academic qualifications, recommendation letters, and references are all together and well organized. This shows that you have organizational skills. Also, very important, a good night's rest prior to the interview is a healthy, is a healthy start for your day. Also ensure that you are very well energized and healthy meal prepared for the day to set your tool. Also, room and dress. Dress for success. First impressions are crucial. Find the appropriate attire, dress professionally. A well-groomed candidate shows you're serious about the job opportunity. In the instance of virtual interview rooms, first, you must set an area which is distraction free and also an area where the back background is free and clear from any clutter and must be appropriate for an interview setting. Today, we move on to the presentation. Presentation, take, an, take a positive approach as a human resource officer. We want to see that you're passionate about the job field and the job you're applying for. So bring some energy and high enthusiasm into the room. Demonstrate confidence, speak distinctly, be articulate. 
listen carefully and keep the viewers engaged by asking questions. Always have one significant achievement to talk about during the interview. This shows you're proactive and a high achiever and more likely to be hired. After the interview follow-ups are, are, after the interview follow-ups are good, but it must be that you keep it to a minimal level and not too excessive. Also, and one call is important or an email and you will get a response from your personnel. I do hope this interview tips has made you more aware of what you require on the job in terms of preparation for this interview. Now I'll hand you over to my colleague, Marta, who will highlight the job opportunities at Eldorado Offshore. Thank you. Thank you, Seema. Good morning, everyone. My name is Martha Wickham, and I will be presenting on the topic of recruitment opportunities at Eldorado Offshore Trinidad Limited. Eldorado Offshore Trinidad Limited is a Trinidadian based company with offices across the region. We are located in Guyana, Suriname, Colombia, Jamaica, and also in the process of expanding internationally, more so the United States of America. We liaise with clients from the oil and gas industry to provide job opportunities for persons both onshore and offshore. In addition to recruitment, we provide human resource and payroll services to employers and by extension, employees. Eldorado Offshore currently has employees located onshore and offshore. Frequently filled positions onshore are as follows. Engineering, technicians, wash bay attendants, warehouse attendants, plant operators, maintenance assistants, repair and maintenance technicians, as well as general laborers. In addition to the previously mentioned information, I am pleased to inform you of frequently filled positions offshore. Our offshore positions are located on both vessels and rigs. Some vacancies available on vessels are in the areas of captain, chief mate, second mate, third mate, able-bodied seamen, and various types of engineers. While cementing field specialists, solids control specialists, cementing hand, mud logger, sample catcher, operator, technician, chemical process specialist, and environmental solution specialist, just to name a few, are positions recruited for rigs. The following is required in order to be considered for the aforementioned positions. Please note that this information is in no particular order, but aims to give you, the audience, an insight as to what documents you will most likely need in order to successfully be onboarded as an employee. Number one, an updated resume. Number two, relevant academic certificates and job experience. Number three, an OGUK medical. Number four, a certificate of character. Number five, photograph identification. And number six, relevant offshore training. Please note that the required documents vary based on the job position and location. Do not be alarmed if you do not hear a job vacancy that commensurates with your academic qualifications for training. Feel free to apply. And once you fit the requirements, we will contact you. Our email address is recruitment.tt at eldoradooffshore.com. Thank you for listening. I will now pass you over to my colleague, Candice, who will provide more insight on offshore training. Good morning, everyone. My name is Candice Callender, and I'm a human resource officer at Eldorado Offshore. This morning, I'd like to speak to you about offshore training. These trainings and courses are provided for the safety and well being of the workers to maximize awareness and knowledge. Two basic requirements for working with Eldorado Offshore will be an OGUK medical which is the Oil and Gas United Kingdom, or the UCOA Medical, which is the United Kingdom Offshore 
operators association. And these two medicals can be obtained at occupational health solutions. We also have TBOZ and HUET. This is the tropical basic safety offshore induction and emergency training. The HUAT will be helicopter underwater escape training, and these two can be obtained at Rely New Tech. The job opportunities currently at Eldorado Offshore. These jobs, we the applicants, we seek for will be mechanic, welders, and, and electricians. The requirements are similar for these. Confined space entry. This training teaches you how to recognize hazards and mitigate for restricted access workspaces. The STCW 95.3-2 standards of training certification and water keeping for seafarers. Marine welders, formal underwater welding training for an accredited, from an accredited dive school. So all these will be persons that we currently have employed with us. And these will be the trainings that you will have to obtain. So for our drillers, drillers have a very dynamic demanding position as you are directly responsible for the safety of persons on board of integrity offshore installation. As such, more rigorous specialized training is needed. Another opportunity that we have at EVU will be a cook and a campus. So these persons will have to have training at a school specified for cooking, right? When you guys have an emergency, your roles as a crew aboard a vessel is very small. So I would like to say a heartfelt thanks to each of you for listening. And we hope that the information related to you today takes you one step closer to finding your dream job within the energy sector. From the entire EDO team, we wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much, ladies, for enlightening us on not only resume writing and interview tips, but also opportunities on shore and offshore with EDU. So we do have a few questions in the chat. So we want to get started with the questions. Uh, feel free to drop any additional questions that you guys have in the chat. We'll be getting started with the Q&A session from the resume writing uh, and interview tips shortly. Okay, so first question uh, sent in the chat, how to apply for EDO offshore and can a Guyanese apply for EDO offshore in Trinidad? Yes, absolutely. Um, so um, you can apply um, by sending a resume to our recruitment email. So that's recruitment.tt at eldoradooffshore.com. Um, you can feel free to apply um, whether you're based in Trinidad and want to work in Trinidad or Guyana. Or if you're based in Guyana, um, interested in opportunities there, um, you know, because we are based regionally, so you can feel free to apply. And of course, we once we get your resume, we'll filter you accordingly. Um, so uh, any available job opportunities we have at the time, we would get in contact with you and, um, you know, take it further from there. 
Okay, so we have another question directed uh, with regards to resumes. So what is the ideal amount of pages for a resume? Right, so um, ideally it depends on how much working experience that you have. So for example, let's say that you have just graduated um, from university. Um, ideally one page should be fine, um, two pages once you're including the cover letter of course. Um, let's say you have about uh, two to three years experience um, or more, you can go anywhere between um, let's say two to four pages at most. Um, of course, uh, try to keep it condensed and concise um, as much as possible. But uh, um, yeah, it really just depends on how much experience you have, because um, you'll, of course, want to include it all there. Okay, sounds good. Uh, another question. Uh, if you include work experience, but you're involved in special projects, can you include a short description of it? Or is it necessary to be included in the resume or rather the cover letter? Right. Um, so you can include this in your resume if you'd like. Um, if there are projects that you would have worked on, um, anything that you spearheaded or had a really big role in that you want to include there. Um, of course, you can include a project section within your resume. OK, great. And last question that we have here. Uh, what opportunities are available in the field of supply chain management? And what are your thoughts on this? Right. OK, no problem. Um, so there are many opportunities um, that are available within this field, um, anywhere from, uh, um, let's say, uh, logistics uh, coordinators. Um, we have, uh, you know, import and export positions available, port clearance positions that are available. Um, you know, so it, it really ranges along the line. And uh, of course, um, in terms of my thoughts on this um, field in particular, it, uh, I mean, it's, it's really important. It's a critical part of operations within any company. And uh, um, I would say that the opportunities are growing in a really big way and in a really quick way. Um, so, you know, once you're interested in this field, I would say, you know, keep furthering yourself there and uh, you know, keep reaching out to companies because um, once you, you get that basic training and, you know, you get started in the field and there are so many opportunities to grow there. Okay, uh, we have one final question. I think this is probably an important one. Mm -hmm. uh, other than having educational certificates, so this might be someone who probably doesn't have as much work experience. How impactful is it to have extracurricular activities and achievements uh, on your resume? Right, so yeah, this is something I think that would boost your resume in a really big way. Um, you know, a lot of times companies would look out for these extracurriculars, um, especially when they're looking at things like culture fit within an organization or, you know, just in general being involved, um, you know, with like, let's say it's community service or anything of that nature. Um, definitely include it in your resume um, once you have these um, extracurricular activities um, that you're, you know, doing. Um, it's something that would definitely boost your resume and, you know, um, give you an edge. Okay, great. Uh, thanks once again for your presentation, um, by you and your team, and for answering all the questions posted in the chat. Thank you, too. Okay, next we have our leveraging LinkedIn to get hired session. As a student myself, LinkedIn has been great, a great tool for me in connecting with others and building my network. So let's get right into the session. And we have none other than Cadelia Achill, communication supervisor at Rams Logistics and the co-founder of Resurite Career Consultants. Cadelia, over to you. Hi, everyone. Welcome again. So now that you know everything about resume writing, and obviously getting that document prepared, we want to talk to you about a bit about branding and branding yourself as a professional. So what do I mean by that? On Instagram, we use Instagram as a way of branding our lifestyle, showcasing everything that we do on a day-to-day. -day. We use Facebook in order to connect to family and friends and to show our support to whatever they're into. So on LinkedIn, we're gonna use that in order to build a professional network in order to build a better way 
to be recruited and hired, right? So we're gonna use um, LinkedIn to leverage ourselves to be hired. So we're gonna move on. So why LinkedIn? So LinkedIn itself is a platform that has over millions of professionals. And on LinkedIn, it has 500 million members. And it's a great way to build and manage your professional identity. This is what you do in order to build a network, one. And also, you need to be active in those communities in order to be engaging and also be in front of recruiters. So you want to build an engaging professional network and it also allows you, the LinkedIn platform itself, gives you access to a lot of knowledge and insights within your different industries. And it's a great way to identify and connect opportunities as well. So why use LinkedIn? 75% of hiring managers review a candidate's LinkedIn profile. Same way that you may Google yourself just to see what pops up, a recruiter will Google you to see what you do professionally. 80% of professionals of positions are filled through a referral. So persons usually refer persons on LinkedIn and that gives them an opportunity to tell um, the experience of working with a candidate or working for a candidate. And this way you build a brand in order for recruiters to see that you are trusted and able to, to perform at the job school. 43% of recruiters report social professional networks as their top source of quality hires. Because you're building a brand, it shows that you are very in tune of what you are, well, who you are and what you can provide. So that gives an overall view of what you can bring to the table to fill a job position. 94% of recruiters use LinkedIn to research candidates. As before, once it's Google, Googleable, <laughs> I guess, um, you will be, it will be there on, so on the internet. Your Instagram profile will be on the internet. Your Facebook profile will be on, on the internet. So why not build a professional network that can actually get you hired, right? So that's, a, that's basically why we would use LinkedIn. So building your profile. So for building your profile is very important to understand that you're building a quality relational network, not a quantity relational network. What do I mean by that? I'm meaning that this is not Facebook, right? You're not just going to add all of your friends and families. What you're looking to do is establish a quality network, persons that you can engage and persons who can engage you a community where you can learn and add value to your professional assets in order to be hired. You need to think aspirational. So you're not thinking of where you are now, you're thinking of where you want to be, right? So that is a network that you need to build. And these are just some of the different profiles that we have um, that I've seen on LinkedIn that I thought that I would just pull together and we will go through why those two on the, the ends are yeses and the middle one is a no. So for the ease of this presentation, I actually use my profile so that you can get an idea of someone who is doing it on a day-to-day -day level, right? And these are different, these are different and specific parts of your LinkedIn profile that you definitely need to pay attention to. So signing up for LinkedIn is at, at same as any other social network. You sign in with a Google, with a Gmail or email address. You can sign and then you will build a profile. Right. The first thing you would realize is that I have a nice clear picture of my face. It's nicely lit. Um, it's engaging. I'm smiling. It's a clear background. You want something that is very warm and inviting because you're inviting persons to connect with you. So you don't want something that shows you with an angry face or it's too busy that you can't really see the person's face clearly. Um, you don't want um, a, a party picture, right? Even though it's a clear picture, you don't want it in that sort of setting, right? So investing in a headshot will be your best bet. Another thing is your banner. So this has been 
an, in an increase in banners recently um, on LinkedIn to, to basically show um, or basically identify yourself out from the crowd, right? So while your profile photo should be professional and conservative, your background photo is a way to show off your brand and personality. So on mine, um, I have my brand tag, my name, and I'm saying let's connect because that's what I initially want to do, right? And in the um, images on my banner as well, I basically put a few of the images of the things that I do. So I'm a digital marketer. I work with community and media relations. So it, it speaks to my brand and what I am trying to build. Next, we're going to talk about your headline. So your headline, what I'm talking about when I say headline is where you see experience, communicator, digital marketer, community and media relations. Um, your headline should entice readers to click your profile or scroll on to learn about your experience or background. Basically, it's supposed to give a snippet of who you are in a second read. Because, because LinkedIn is full of 500 million users, you want to definitely speak to who you are quickly so that persons are immediately interested in you. So, and this also gives an idea to a recruiter like, hey, this person knows what they're about. This person has a niche and they're very strong um, and confident in what they do. Um, next, we're gonna go down to the summary page. So this summary section, it could be as long as short as you want it to. Usually I put something short because I know person's reading span is not that great <laughs> these days with the, um, as we're living in, a, in a, a world of reels and TikTok. So I usually put a short snippet to kind of give an idea of me as an all around person. Um, person. It, it includes my experience and also my personality because we have to keep in mind that recruiters are also looking for a personality that can fit into a team. So even though you may have the tech technical skills, you also need to have those personality traits. And I want to stress on using appropriate keywords. For every job scope, there are keywords that you should pay attention to in certain JDs, um, along the lines, along the lines of um, looking on persons, um, the company's website. You will see that they're looking for a type of person um, and the technical abilities as well. And so you pull out certain keywords in order to um, paint the picture that you are that perfect all around person. So what do I mean by keywords? Um, my use of creative there um, as a creative communications professional, that speaks to who I am, right? You want to use words like exceptional interpersonal abilities, right? So that speaks to my communication and me being as a communicator, right? Um, you want to speak to something like strategic communication, um, so you want to pull out certain keywords in order for you to stand out, for, for the critter to get a gist of who you are really quick. You also want to put in different aspects of your life that may apply. So I put in that I'm a dual citizen, that I could work in two countries because you never know what a recruiter may be looking for and you never know how that may add value to their search. Next, it will be experience. So for the, for the experience section, you don't want to just state your duties, right? You wanna save that to, for your resume. Um, you want to let employers know how you've impacted your organization in your role. So you will need to highlight key accomplishments um, in your breakdown of your experience. So how I choose to have it here, it's a breakdown of my year to year top highlights that I feel like I've worked on, um, put in a lot of work on with my team and we have clear indicators of success. So how, how you can think about it is, am I working on a project? Did it have the, the successful impact that, that I wanted? Um, did it impact the organization? Did it change anything within the organization that they could be using years from now, um, even when I leave? then yes, you definitely wanna put it on there. Even though it's day-to-day -day duties that you probably do, it is still impacting the organization and you want to highlight it. 
So make sure that you're not just drowning out your experience section with just your duties. You want to definitely highlight key accomplishments when you're doing so. Another section is um, your project highlights. So as I was talking about your, in your experience section, you can highlight other, um, your key accomplishments. You definitely want to add media or publications, um, articles, video coverage that will speak to those, those projects. Um, any presentations that you would have done, et cetera, along those lines any webinars, anything along those lines that will speak to the actual projects you have listed, you definitely want to, to add it there so persons can click and actually see the product of all of your efforts. Next, we wanna go on to education. So for your education, you want to definitely show all levels of education. You want to show where you started to where you are right now, right? Some persons with this, some of their core, um, different courses within um, the educational level, which is fine. You can include activities and honors. What this does is it increases commonality. So um, just like how you're listing that you worked at a certain company, you can connect with other persons within that company. You can also do that for your education. So me, by me putting King's College London, I'm able to connect to that community within LinkedIn. And when you're searching for certain positions, it can let you know like, hey, this is a great position for you because you, you, you studied here at, at King's College London. So that's how the algorithm works within LinkedIn. So you don't want to overpopulate it with 60 courses. You want to pull out certain ones that would speak to your brand, as, you, as I told you before, um, that headline, you want, to, you want to definitely pull out certain ones that highlight only key ones in order to add value to your profile. And this is a very important section. It's as, as important as your headline. Recommendations. So LinkedIn has an, uh, gives you an opportunity to be recommended by other persons on your platform. You can also give recommendations to others but you have an opportunity now to gain recommendations through your work and persons you've worked for or worked with um, to connect you and to add value to your brand. And this, with them speaking on the type of person you are, your work ethic, this is building trust within your brand so that when recruiters come to your page, they can clearly see that, hey, she's a great person to work with. She can do the job scoop that I'm looking for. Why not give, it, give her a chance, right? Um, so this is definitely a must. It's one of the most important things on your, pay, on your profile page to definitely pay attention to. And once you build out your, your profile, this is something that you should immediately get on as well as um, making sure that it stay tuned to your brand on your page. Some other bonus tips, tips that I can give you. Your certifications, add certifications that enhance your skill level. LinkedIn allows you to do certain skill tests in order to put badges on your profile. These are simple ones like Microsoft Office, Microsoft Excel. You work with it every day. You can definitely do it. Take five minutes of your day, do the skill test, and you get these badges. And it just beefs up your profile a little bit more. If you're doing certifications on Coursera um, or other um, online platforms, when you get a certificate, def definitely add it in here. It adds value and it brings more to your skill set. Um, volunteerism, definitely add. Your, um, your service um, for any NGO or any party that you would have worked with, but also illustrate the professional skills within each. So what did you learn out of volunteering? What skills, that it, what skills did you gain from it? So you want to definitely show that you're not using your time aimlessly. You're using these, these uh, um, initiatives in order to build your brand and add value to it. Um, another way to optimize your profile is to customize your link. There's a way to edit your URL link where um, it increase, increases your chances of when you're being Googled, your LinkedIn profile pops to the top of it. 
um, so that your Facebook or Instagram may not be the first ones that recruiters may see. So you want to definitely change your link so that it ends with your name. So it gets, goes linkedin.com slash and your name so that um, it gives the best search results when you're being searched by a recruiter. Content is definitely important. After you build your profile, you definitely want to ensure that you are engaging the community that you want to be in. You're building a network after all. So you have to engage, you definitely have to post, reshare, comment on the um, colleagues' posts. So you want to show that you're engaging, you're talking to persons, you're adding value to the community. And when you're doing that, it beats up your, your profile and your brand and the algorithm, the, the algorithm within LinkedIn takes your profile and shares it out and distributes it to even more persons. So your, your chance of getting um, seen by a recruiter is even higher. And of course you build your network, right? You start off with your immediate circle of friends and colleagues, and then the algorithm will take you further and further out. The more interested you get in certain topics on LinkedIn through your content, it will refer you to different communities and to different persons. And you keep, you keep following, you keep um, connecting with persons and you build a strong network so that Persons already know your brand, they trust your brand, and so it's very easy for a recruiter to give you a chance. And yeah, that's it for me. Um, I hope you like the presentation. I hope you have a good idea of how to build your brand on LinkedIn, how to use LinkedIn and leverage it to get hired. And also, if you are very unsure about LinkedIn also, I do um, co-manage a company called Resurite, and you can find us on all socials, um, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and we provide that service to you and we could guide you along so that you can set up and establish your brand profile and also make sure that you're obviously maintaining it at the standard that we would want you to, to do. And so, yeah, thank you so much. And let me know if you have any questions in the chat section. Hey, thanks, Cadelia. This was very insightful as many students use their online resources to build a social, social connection within the context of their personal lives. However, the time to build professional networks is just as important. So thank you again for giving us a better understanding of LinkedIn and how to go about utilizing it as a tool for professional development. So we do have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so someone asks, what exactly should the cover letter entail? I guess, and they probably mean the about on your LinkedIn profile. Okay, so think of the about section as like your summary on your resume. You want to give a few lines of who you are and include your personality and your experience as well. So you want to definitely showcase how many years of experience you have, what are your core technical skill sets. So they are definitely things that you are very much experienced, like close to expert at. You definitely want to highlight those. And you definitely want to show that you can work well with people, right? So that you can engage in a team, you can lead a team, those type of things that you'd want to showcase. You definitely want to read, read um, different JDs and get those keywords as well to apply so that it always connects back to that brand, that core brand that you're building. Okay, great. Um, another question someone asks, uh, do they have to attach any pictorial evidence of their certificates? On LinkedIn, you'd, I don't believe they ask you to upload a certificate, but if you would like to, you can do so in the experience section. But I'm not, I don't think that you need to have those evidences on, um, on LinkedIn. I would say more focus on the media per se that speaks to the projects that you would have done and shows your results versus the certificates. Okay, great. And our last question, someone asked, you indicated uh, changing your URL link. So is there like a particular website or how do you go about changing the URL link on LinkedIn to include your name at the end 
to make yourself more uh, marketable. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, on LinkedIn itself, you don't need to go to another website. Once you log into LinkedIn, in the settings section, I think it's the account settings, you will have, um, you, will, you will see a URL, URL profile, change URL profile um, link. And once you click there, the link will pop up and you can edit it however you want to. The LinkedIn.com will stay intact. And anything after that, you can definitely put in your name. You can put in any other thing. I suggest putting in your name alone so that it ties back to um, your LinkedIn profile because essentially that is what the recruiter will be searching, your name. Okay, marvelous. All right, thanks once again, Pidelia. No problem. Okay, so EDO is the leading supplier in manpower and recruitment. And it's only fitting that we hear firsthand the impact EDU has on the lives of others with some testimonials. And we have Ms. Oswald Catlin and Jeline Jocelyn to give us these testimonials here today. So while we're waiting for uh, Ms. Catlin and Ms. Jocelyn, uh, Please be prompted. There should be a pop up on your screen uh, with a poll. Feel free to take your time, reach your questions, and select which learning module stood out to you more. Hi, good day, everyone. Okay, so uh, let's get started with the testimonials. First, we have up, we have Sir Oswald Catlin. Hi, good day, everyone. Um, it was an honor to be chosen for this virtual workshop here today. Um, Eldorado contacted me, asked me if I could do a little testimonial on working with them. Um, uh, we're not hearing you clearly. Uh, just be sure that you are muted. Yes. You hear me clearly now? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clearly. All right. Yeah, so it's a pleasure meeting you all, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I've been contacted by El Dorado, in whom I work for, uh, to give a short testimonial of my position, held and everything. So I'll start with that. <clears throat> Uh, my name, as you can see, is Oswald Catlin. I've been in this industry for the oil and gas industry for as long as 15 years plus. I've been working with El Dorado, say, a year, a little over a year right now. Um, my position currently is with Halliburton. Uh, I hold field service engineer in Halliburton currently. Now, the life, uh, people call it the offshore life, is a bit hard at times, but we work on like 21 days off, 21 days on, sometimes 28. Uh, back in my days, we used to work a longer, you know. Um, the experience with El Dorado is like a family. I have worked a couple of places before, and... It brings, El Dorado brings a different vibe. You know, they, they, they show genuine concern for you, you know, and it's more like a family, more than a company. I will class it as that. My day-to-day -day activities will be like, okay, when you go offshore, uh, you work 12 hours. So you have 12 hours on, 12 hours off. So the 12 hours, 
you have on shift, of course, you have your lunch time, your break times. And I work currently with El Dorado in something in the completion phase currently of the drilling aspect of the rig. So after they drill the well, I hold a position where we use special types of fluids, um, which is considered completion fluids. So I am part of the filtration crew where we clean these fluids to spec. So when they are producing the oil from it, um, this is something like an injection. These fluids clean the well bore. The well bore is basically the drilling hole of the well and extract the oil from the well bore. Um, a little background of my experience, I have held on as a manager with a company before. I have held on as an uh, environmental specialist. I have held on as in many positions. I have run a, a whole um, a whole lab already, you know, and it, it is challenging at times. But um, I will tell you all, and I'll, the advice I will give you all today is keep pursuing it. You know, sometimes it's difficult, but you have to keep pursuing it and love your job. That's important. Love your job and work with your job like it's the first day. Always work like it's the first day you're working with the company. You know, that helps to uplift you in certain certain ways. Uh, employer likes to see. <clears throat> My employer likes to see, you know, you're always willing to work is the willingness. You will know everything at the end of the day in the aspect of you'll have your training, you'll go, you'll do your degrees. I'm a mechanical background. I'm also, I also have um, human resource background also, but um, project management background. But one thing other employer loves to see is willingness. Other than your degree, you know, or your diplomas, uh, willingness to work is very important. It's a key factor in working in the oil industry. Uh, it's also be a team player. Team player is very important. And also always, I will advise you all, always be humble. Be humble in everything that you do. Um, I guess this is the end of my testimonial for working with El Dorado. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Oswald, for your, your testimonials. Uh, I definitely agree with a lot of the points that you brought forward, especially one that perseverance, about perseverance and team building. Uh, so next we have Ms. Jeline Jocelyn to give her testimonial being a part of EDO. Ms. Jocelyn, are you with us? Um, good morning, everyone. So afternoon, I should. I am having some issues displaying with the video. The host blocked me. I just need someone to unblock me, please. Okay, so while we try to work out. Okay, Hi. yeah, we're seeing you clearly. Okay, so Good take day, it away, Miss Jocelyn. Right, so I'm in contact with as well to give a short little testimony of my experience being employed under them. And I recently started, uh, next month would be six months being employed under EDO. And I have been placed at Weatherford Shogonas. Right. Um, my portfolio there is an RM technician, RM being a repair and maintenance technician. Presently, um, so my position entails preparing the tools for those offshore rigs and them. Right. So we prepare um topple tools, all these circulation devices, as Oswald well touched on. We get those tools ready for dispatch so that when it reaches the rig, those guys, they have um, 
everything prepared and ready to carry on with whether it is a completion well or whatnot. Right. Um, throughout my time there with EDO, uh, they have welcomed me with open arms. Right. They made me felt um well in a way to put it a little more than family, right? Any issues I had they looked in it, whatnot, made sure everything was okay. Um we cannot wear up what has taught me a lot more than what I thought the job was about, right? With them, um, and I would say for anyone who is interested in working in the oil and gas sector, mm -hmm. safety is the number one and primary concern, also being competent, being able <clears throat> to carry out whatever tasks and duties assigned to you in the most, responsible and safe manner because it, it is not the regular job you know um uh incidents accidents near misses bound to happen it is a very dangerous job but also fulfilling in the form that apart from the danger danger of it you know you, you get to learn how things work in in a more um open aspect something that that will be simple to the person who is on the outside for the persons working in the industry it gives you a, a wider variety of knowledge and um sure my time there i did i came from utt as a process operation operator and um this job just gave me the the extra knowledge, I would say, so that when it is, I have to go offshore, I would fully understand from the ground up in terms of um, preparing equipments and stuff straight up to operating them, knowing the different procedures and of how they work, you know? So um, it is really an interesting career path and I would urge any and everyone who has a passion for it to, charge at it with full force. Uh, so that's it for me. Okay, thank you, Miss Jocelyn, for your testimonial today. Uh, finally, as we come to an end on our career workshop today, we have with us Miss Evangeline Paradisi, the president of the UTT SB student chapter, to give us our closing remarks. All right, so while we're waiting on Ms. Paradisi, uh, I hope that the participants here today would have at least gained some form or some level of knowledge or uh, insight into the various topics discussed today from the safety within the oil and gas to the renewable energy session, even the resume writing and LinkedIn, building your LinkedIn. These things are important factors in the development of your professional careers as students and young professionals. Thank you, Adrian, for the introduction. In words of the famous English poet T.S. Eliot, to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. Here we are at the end of our very first virtual career fair in Trinidad and Tobago, and the poet's words gave us something to think about as we prepare to set off, hopefully to make a new beginning. I remember my very first career workshop experience when I entered university, and that was definitely the stepping stone to who I am today and the passion that I have for this industry. I've always viewed forums like this as a great opportunity, as it not only promotes a space of growth in developing one's personal and technical skills, but also connecting and building one's network. We are all learning from each other, as each of us has stories, experiences, and a wealth of knowledge to share with others. This career workshop has enabled us to take a fresh, in-depth look at many relevant matters pertaining to the oil and gas industry. 
We have been nourished with brilliant presentations from top subject matter experts. With that being said, I wish to thank our featured speakers and all the presenters who took the time to prepare these impressive presentations. Also many thanks to the organizers for the time they've spent in ensuring this event is such a success. I'm sure many will agree with me that the host of this workshop has exceeded himself in ensuring that this workshop is one of the most memorable. I would also like to thank each of you who signed on today and participated in this virtual career fair. I know some of you here may be juggling school and work and whatever else life has for you. So I really want to thank you for taking the time to be here today. We hope that this event was impactful and each of you took away at least one thing over the past few hours. To the participants today, we will be sending out the link to the recording of this event. And please keep an eye out for future events from both UTTSP and El Dorado Offshore. Be sure to stay connected with us. And with that being said, I wish, wish each of you the very best in your future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Paradisi, for those closing remarks. Uh, before you guys leave, we will just have a short poll. It should pop up on your screen to fill out. It only take you a few seconds, a minute at most. So feel free to fill out the poll. Uh, with that being said, I'd like to thank everyone for joining in today. It was a pleasure to be your host. And I do hope this workshop was impactful in some way to each one of you.